All right, everybody, welcome to the replay of this session on expanding your attention span and really excited to go through this material. This is Anthony Metivier from magneticmemorymethod.com. If you're joining us, feel free to uh, hit that thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world in the chat. Hashir is here. Hello, Hashir. It's been a while since that we saw you. Thanks for saying hello. Attention span is, of course, one of the most critical things that you'll ever develop for yourself in the world, and it is the richness and the fullness of your learning life to be able to focus for extended periods of time in order to get not only lots of information into your mind, but to process it internally inside your mind, and then to produce it and externalize it through different processes of writing exams, speaking with people. I know a lot of people, they feel very frustrated that they have lots of really great ideas, but they're not able to enunciate them. They don't have diction and they don't have dexterity with the way that they're bringing words out of their mouths into the world, and that's really frustrating. And a lot of that has to do with attention span. Because if you're not actively engaged in both the input and the output and the internal reflection, then yes, you're going to have difficulties expressing yourself and basically being eloquent through elocution and diction and all of the wonderful things that are possible when you have the fullest possible attention span and you work on it consistently throughout your life. And of course, you can use a memory palace to help you do that. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you're just joining us, hit that thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world. Hashir says, great, sir, from Pakistan, Karachi. Um, by the way, always Anthony, never sir. If you must be formal, it's Dr. Metivier. Uh, I am speaking about these topics because I have a PhD and I have two MAs and a BA and a bunch of certifications from this, that, and the other thing that I did, ranging from hypnotherapy to how to serve at a a bar, essentially. <laughs> a long adventure on that one. And uh, those certifications, of course, were all things that, you know, people need attention span for, and I needed attention span for, particularly the PhD, because there were lots and lots of books to read. And I was so glad to have the memory technique of the Memory Palace help me and to really explore it for many, many years ever since, and have it aid my attention span. So I'm going to share some real heavy duty hacks and strategies that anybody can benefit from, from here in the Magnetic Memory Method headquarters in Brisbane. Physico is here, says, so lucky to be in this moment with a great and chill man. Greetings from Brazil, Dr. Metivier. Well, thank you, Physico, for being here. Always great to see you. If you're just joining us, don't be shy. Unlock the floodgates of your participation. It'll help your attention span if you're engaged. Say hello in the chat. Let me know where you are and hit that thumbs up. And what do you think of this outer space thing? We're having um, uh, some new experiments and trying new things. And there's some green spill from the green screen. But uh, once we get that solved, I think we're going to be having a lot more... Uh, a lot more fun than uh, <laughs> I ever imagined possible. Uh, and this is all part of the Batman expansion of the Magnetic Memory Method universe. So that is uh, a lot of fun to have uh, everybody's interest and support in that as we work on making everything cooler and better and uh, really enjoy <laughs> doing these experiments and just making the channel cooler and cooler. So if you're not subscribed, get subscribed, hit the thumbs up. Uh, William is here from Chiang Mai. Hello, William. Oh, so good to see you. I always love uh, when I see your name. Really wonderful. And I always appreciate uh, our many correspondences over the years and having you in the masterclass, uh, of course, if memory serves. And it's not a wi different William Butler. <laughs> um, really great that you're here. And I want to say a congratulations to someone named Parth. I think that's how you pronounce it, who said, and this was a chat that he added after the last live stream, which was on how to study fast. And if you haven't gone through that, you'll see like there's 70 comments there. And one of them was from Parth, who said that as a result of your techniques, I aced my geography exam with 76.5 out of 80 marks. So congratulations to Parth. If you haven't hit thumbs up already, hit a huge thumbs up for Parth. If you have a soul, say congratulations to Parth here, because when he shows up later or uh, uh, watches the replay, he'll be cheered on uh, already. I just saw it because Sarah Crickall, a great uh, YouTube channel she has herself, said congratulations just now to follow up on his uh, 
congratulations giving and wow that's awesome that is a huge huge result and uh, i always appreciate when people let me know what they're doing because it is a fantastic thing to hear all the success stories so um in case you're wondering what's going on with this forward slash vm head on over there because if you well head on over there only if you're interested in a webinar walkthrough that I'm going to be doing. And what that's all about is that I have finished pretty much the outline for a new book and I am inviting you to join us on a walkthrough of the outline. But it's about meditation and memory. And so if you're not interested in that, obviously don't <laughs> sign up for that. But if you are, it's at magneticmarymethod.com forward slash vm. And what we're going to do is go through the outline and essentially produce some of, of the book. And I will go through all of the skills. So there's going to be a lot on the meditation skills, the focus and concentration skills, and the actual use of these skills in memory palaces. So we got to also talk about memory palaces. So if you want to join us, that's going to be great. I don't know how many people are technically interested in that, but the book is about memory palaces, memory techniques, and meditation together. And ultimately, the suggestion I'm going to make for you there is that using memory techniques is always already a kind of meditation. So I'm really, really excited to uh, have that outline more or less done. We generated already a lot of the outline on a previous live stream. So I really thank everybody who was part of that. I didn't think it was going to go in that direction, but I know that uh, that's the direction that I certainly want to go with it, and I hope uh, that there's interest in that. And if not, no big deal. Um, <laughs> but uh, you can register for that at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash BM and uh, be part of it. So that's pretty cool. Now, we've said uh, thank you and congratulations to Parth, and that was fun. Really crazy. No uh, congratulations from any of you all there. Wow. What is going on in the world? I guess you may be... It went over your head in, in the attention span world. But I congratulate you, Parth, and I'm sure that people will, uh, if they're not driving, they'll catch up on that soon. Um, in any case, attention span. So really, if you want to have the memory palace as part of how that you're going to increase your attention span, then what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to create memory palaces in advance. And you'll notice that there's an offer there for a free memory improvement kit. It will teach you how to create memory palaces correctly, well-formed memory palaces. If you haven't gone through it, I highly recommend that you do so that you can create memory palaces before you need them. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today assumes that you have a memory palace network, that that network is fleshed out, it's full, it's complete, it's well-rounded, and you have, have some skills in this. And if you don't, well, you'll still learn a lot today. But you want to get take get that taken care of lickety split and the reason why is because you can really really flex and stretch and feel the fullness of your attention span when you have unlocked your spatial memory and your spatial memory unlocks multiple levels of memory it unlocks your autobiographical memory your figural memory your semantic memory your procedural memory your episodic memory and all of these things are the kinds of levels of memory that you need in action in order to really start to use memory palaces in order to help you expand your attention span. So if you think about the memory palace as kind of like a canvas in your mind, and we'll talk later about the theater of your mind, but imagine like there's a green screen behind me and you need to be painting on the screen that's hanging in the theater of your mind and you have multiple screens in the theater of your mind, then you're going to need a palette. Right? And you're going to paint with your episodic memory, your semantic memory, your figural memory, your procedural memory, your figural memory, and so on and so on. And the more that you have those rich colors of memory on your palette, then the greater your command over your strokes are going to be as you paint with magnetic imagery there. And the greater benefits of focus and concentration and your attention span is going to be in order to really, really stay with the moment, right? But you need well-formed memory palaces in order to do that because it'll be a fighting battle if you don't have them well-formed. And there's just some principles and whatnot that are covered in the free course. The link is in the description for that course below. You can click it um, or you can just go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT and uh, 
it's a, a wonderful thing. And if you ever have any issues with it, make sure you clear your cache, uh, your browser, because sometimes uh, things can get weird on the internet. And likewise, on this live stream, uh, if you have any issues, then just log out and log in again, clear your cache on your browser, get closer to the router and all that jazz, and that will help. Now, once you have that done, then you want to get really comfortable with using your memory palaces for flexing your uh, attention span and your concentration and your focus. So make sure you have a sense of the multiple points of views, POVs that you can use in, uh, in your memory palaces. So it's third person, second person, first person, and there may be uh, there's, there are others like fusing them all together and then there's the magnetic memory method constellation view which I highly recommend you get into and uh, that uh, is a skill in and of itself and you're going to want to master that as quickly as possible because it's not only going to help your attention span because as you practice these techniques you'll be focusing on developing those multiple kinds of POV moving towards a constellation effect but you'll also uh, you, you, you'll just be able to actually increase your attention span by using the information you've memorized, uh, which is a beautiful thing. So Bad Ba is here. Hello, Bad Ba. It's been a while. Long time no see. Great, great to have you here. Um, let me know what you think about the new mise-en-scene. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit complicated, but we're having fun. We're having fun. Um, Physical says, how many types of memory do we have? Every day that I research memory, I find one more, and I don't know if they are the same or just synonyms. Great question, Physical. Here's the reality. I... I think that there, there's an infinity of potential <laughs> types of memory, but one of the things to really concentrate on and focus on is your practice with them. And if you want to memorize all those different names, then use the tools to help you memorize them and create distinctions. And we'll talk more about some additional tools that will help you segment essentially in your mind through the practice of knowledge so that you not only have a command of like what those terms are but from whom they come if you want to add those details uh, and just br brace yourself and we'll talk about this later brace yourself for people to use the same term in different ways to the extent that it almost seems like they're talking about different things because it's that different so I'm reading Maps of Meaning right now by Jordan Peterson and I can tell you that some of the ways that he's using episodic memory and semantic memory in particular, they're a little bit different than I've encountered them used in other places. Not a right or wrong thing, it's just a different thing. And ultimately the way he is using memory leads to this term he uses, nestic memory, which is really fascinating. And so far, not really fully defined, but I get a sense of what he means. Uh, so, you know, I wouldn't get too hung up on all the different uh, definitions of memory. There's potentially, potentially, not in reality, but potentially there's as many levels or kinds or types of memory as there are people to come up with crazy terms to name it. But for our purposes, really the ones that I focus on helping you unlock in the magnetic memory method world are episodic, semantic, figural, procedural, and spatial. And really uh, what you might call conceptual memory and uh, olfactory memory and gustatory memory, but those all belong to other terms. I just point them out as levels of memory that you can tap into. But great, great question, Physico. Uh, and ultimately just, <laughs> it's in some sense, follow your bliss if you're interested in memory science and just understand that that rabbit hole goes very, very deep and just go into it as deeply as you want to go. And, uh, you know, Always be yourself, unless you could be Batman, and then always be Batman. So just f pick your pick your battle, is what I'm saying, and uh, and create the game that you want to win when it comes to terminology, and create the game that you want to be not not only the winner of, but that you cheerfully want to play again and again and again. All right, so basically that's it for this kind of setup. If you're not set up, get yourself set up. Go take the free course. And if you want to join us for the walkthrough of the book, go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash BM and get yourself registered and you'll have a lot of fun with us um, if you're interested in meditation and memory. So I will just uh, hide that little sucker for a second. And uh, here we go. So one huge tip for you that's going to really, really help is to create specific memory palaces for specific content. And so what that means is you 
you know, want to put some planning into things. Preparation, predetermination. Think about what it is that you want to practice memorizing for the purposes of extending your attention span and then build the memory palace networks to support that goal. So for books, you know, you can strategically go through how that works. There's material on how to memorize a textbook that you can follow to structure what it is that you want to do for particular books, have a general plan that you execute on a book by book basis, and then create the Memory Palace Network that supports book learning, so to speak. Uh, if it's podcasts, if it's video lectures, if it's real time lectures, create the Memory Palace Networks that support the learning goals and outcomes. We'll talk more about goals and outcomes as we go along, but you want to create specific memory palaces for specific outcomes. And I suggest that you do this by choosing substance and depth over quick fix content. So there's a lot of content out there that's about six minutes long in terms of videos and so forth. I wouldn't really go in there with heavy duty memory palaces, obviously, but you might want to go on a large learning project. Maybe uh, it's about, I don't know, whatever, whatever topic that you come up with, contemporary politics, contemporary philosophy, contemporary psychology, or maybe the interesting ways that those three things come together uh, these days in the so-called intellectual dark web. And that's a very fascinating topic to me. So these are things where you might want to put some memory palaces together for so that you can actually memorize in real time while you're practicing uh, paying attention and extending your attention span through the practice of paying attention. Because how else are you going to do it, right? That's how the muscle of attention span gets exercised, through acts of paying attention. And if you're going to use a memory palace, then be strategic, spend some time planning, pick a topic, plan for that topic, then set a time and sit down and encode what it is that you learn about those topics into your memory palaces. Julie's here. Hello, Julie. Yes, this cup. Always thank you for sending me this beautiful, beautiful gift. Thank you so much. Um, wonderful. Speaking of cups, uh, really enjoying all the support we're getting for the show. So if you want to get one of the Magnetic Mary Method cups or other swag, go to magneticmarymethod.com forward slash swag. And there's sweaters and t-shirts there. And uh, someone was telling me, my good friend Nick, that he may be supplying some more colorful artwork for cups and sweaters and so forth. So that'll be cool using our color scheme, which would be fun. Um, but yeah, I generally would say go for substance and depth when you are using memory palaces to help you practice the expansion of your attention span for an obvious reason. If you're just doing fickle information, well then that's information that doesn't require long forms of attention span. The one caveat there we'll talk about later in terms of like jokes, but even then I would focus more on long form jokes to practice your attention span as opposed to short little ones, but it could be a series of short jokes. Now, you also want to avoid the Google effect. So let's say that you've picked a topic, maybe it's just books, and you're now set up with your memory palaces, you're ready to go, you're going to focus on your attention span. You've got to avoid this, ooh, 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 what's this? I'll go look it up, right? You've got to stop impulsively jumping up every time you encounter a word you don't know or a fact that you want more information on and opening a new tab or going to the device or anything like that. It's not necessary to your learning and it will help your attention span if you flag it, bookmark it for later and go check it out later. The exception to this sort of look it up now sort of thing is if the book has an appendix if it has a, 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 a glossary of terms, if it has an index and you want to see if there are other references to that particular person and you want to do a little bit of, you know, priming yourself for what else is coming around that. But that's very interior and localized to the book. You're staying with the book. But if you jump off to a multi-tab universe where it's like, ooh, ooh, and I'll just check my Facebook, and oh, I will check uh, my Twitter, and oh, I will, oh, what's going on on YouTube subscription, blah, 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 blah. If you get into that vortex, you may have a hard time getting back out of it. And so avoid it like the plague. Stick with the program and stay with it and just make notes or memorize what it is you want to look up later and then 
go and look it up later. Same thing with your attention span in conversations. So, you know, there's lots of people, and I have done it sometimes myself, and I work very hard to suppress it because it's simply not necessary. But, you know, somebody mentions the name of a bookstore, and I just decide, well, I'm going to memorize the name of that bookstore. So there's actually one that was mentioned to me, which I believe is called the Book Merchant Jenkins here in Brisbane. I could have looked it up and bookmarked it and so forth, but I was sitting with my friend Martin and he mentioned it and I just memorized the title instead of looking it up and then I looked it up later. And then there was another bookstore he mentioned, which I believe is called Logical Unsanity. And so instead of looking it up then, I just memorized it. I use him as the memory palace and the area around him so that my attention span can stay focused on the moment instead of picking up the device and searching stuff, right? And this has multiple benefits. It's exercising your memory. It's using memory techniques and exercising your ability with memory techniques, but it's using them to keep your attention span where it belongs, on the human in front of you. So the Google effect is really just, oh, I gotta look that up, or I gotta look it up and make a bookmark, or, or I gotta open this device. And you, you know, it's like opening up a Smith's Army knife and then getting caught up in a bunch of tools that you had no need for, you had no intention of ever using, but then you're like, ooh, 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 ooh and you're opening up everything in there. Stay away from that stuff. It's poison for your attention span. It's actually actively destroying your attention span. So very, very important. Avoid the Google effect. So Physico asks, can we add to the micro stations the Vaughn cube stations? I love the spatial logical arrangement of the Vaughn. I just have a little fear that anything crammed around will, will lose meaning. Yeah, well, the Vaughn, the Vaughn cube is great, but the issue with the Vaughn cube is, is that it's not a cure-all for everything. And so what I would suggest that you do is, first of all, think about what you're most likely to do with the Vaughn cube. So the Vaughn cube, if you don't know this, is just a snap-on 10 station per room sort of thing. And one of the traps with using that is that not all rooms are made the same. And not only that, but... 10 stations, you might not be there yet, right? And not only that, but using the ceiling in the center of the floor can be disastrous for your attention span in navigating that memory palace. Can be, might not be. Figure it out for yourself. Experiment and explore and see if that really works for you. My guess is, is that you will tie yourself up in knots really, really quickly if you take the Vaughn Cube as a be-all and the end-all of a way of designing each room. I would be more specific than that. But what you can do is reduce the number and think about what those stations most logically will apply to you. I wouldn't increase the number, but definitely think about reducing it. Now, if you already have stations in a room, then think about, you know, what's the, what, what is the goal? Always, always work from the goal and the outcome that you want and think, is this really a way of proceeding or should I just start with a new memory palace? rather than mucking around with and squeezing stations in between existing stations in an already established memory palace, couldn't you just go start a new one? And it, it, from the benefit of extending your, or from the perspective of extending your attention span, always favor creating new memory palaces. The other reason for doing that is, is if you're going to continue to use that existing memory palace, then you can keep it that way as it is and add more details progressively over time inside of it and create new stations on a station by station as needed basis. So I hope that helps answer your question. Amzal is here and thank you Physico for that question, great one. Um, Amzal says, uh, hello Anthony, I'm an Indian writer. I'm preparing for an exam in which I have to memorize 70 books. Kindly guide me how much keywords to be jotted down in the memory palace because there are 50, page, 50 per page. Well, okay, so um, how many memory palaces have you created? Let's start with that. And once that you know that, then think about how impossible it would be to answer that question. Uh, because I don't know the topic and the keywords amount can't be 50 per page. That doesn't make any sense. And you'd be there all day. So let's come up with a more realistic number based on where you're actually at. So how many memory palaces do you have? How many stations per memory palaces? And what is the nature of these books? And what's a more realistic number? Because if it's 50 per page, well, you can do it. I'm not saying that you can't, but do you really need to? Most people have what I call memory palace scarcity. And what they're doing is they're 
actually trying to cram in more information than is actually needed in order to pass an exam. If you go back to our previous live stream on how to study fast, you will see that we've solved this problem to the nth degree with multiple alternative strategies for figuring out what you really need to prepare for exams. And I think you'll benefit from that a great deal. But there's no, there, I really don't have anything to say when people say they have 50 pieces of information per page. I don't know a page that has 50 pages, pieces of information you must memorize. I've never seen such a thing except for perhaps in a language learning thing. Or if you want to be, uh, I don't have it here, but I'm memorizing Sanskrit. And uh, I, you know, there's probably 50 uh, words per page that I've memorized there, certainly because there's both English and uh, Sanskrit. But I don't really count the English on an information by information basis or even think about the number of um, pieces of individual words there. All I'm concerned with is how my general feeling of how much information per station I can memorize, and that's what I do. And there have been some lines where I need to break that sort of general rule and add a bit more. There are others where I just at a glance don't even need the full station, but I use that station just for that amount anyway and move on. So what I'm generally, uh, what I'm trying to suggest to you, and it's a great question, but it's just one that comes up again and again and again is that people think that they have to memorize more than they do and the reality is is that the more you actually practice these techniques the more you'll just develop the intuition and you'll you'll create your networks according to the information and unless it's verbatim it's very unlikely that there are 50 pieces of information to memorize and if it's for an exam it's very unlikely that that is a practical realistic strategy and it would only be the most sadistic school on the planet that would ever require anybody to be accountable for that much information from a book. I just can't imagine it. And if it is, then, well, we'll talk later <laughs> about how to avoid getting yourself into situations with sadistic uh, schools and teachers like that, because that's crazy. Um, uh, Mr. Space says, even when I don't use Google inside my mind, my thought switches to different things. How should I manage this? Well, that's one of the things that we are... Uh, we are talking about here today. Generally, if you're relaxed when you're reading and you follow some of the other principles that we're going to talk about today, you have your memory palaces in ready in advance and you're actively encoding as you go along, you'll just be having too much fun to skip around to other topics. But if you do skip around to other topics, don't make it a big deal. You know, Freud always talked about the return of the repressed. If you repress that and you make it an enemy, then it becomes a monster and it can destroy your concentration. It can destroy your sense of peace and well-being and relaxation. And that's just not a cool thing to do to yourself. So, you know, the last thing you want to do is turn it into a monster. Um, Harvinder's here. Hello, Harvinder. Thanks for your great email the other day. I really appreciate that, and uh, good to see you here. Uh, Maricella says hi. <laughs> Hello, Maricella. Good to see you also. Um, but, yeah, Mr. Space, if you're... If you find yourself zoning off and so forth, the number one thing is just not to make it an enemy. Don't make it a problem. Start to study your own mind. And we're going to talk today about some of the ways that you can study your own mind, get more intimate with your mind, and, uh, and really turn that into an asset rather than anything that should be bothering you. And uh, one of the things that you can do, we'll talk about next, is memorize points in real time. Now, for those of you who are just joining us, if you haven't said hello yet, please let me know where you are in the world. Hit the thumbs up if you haven't already. If you're interested in one of the ultimate ways to increase your attention span, which is called meditation, then I highly recommend you to go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VM. And uh, I'll pop this in the chat for you. And this is going to be a live walkthrough of the outline for my next book that I'm writing now. And... Uh, that is uh, something I would love to see you there for. And one of the things that we'll do is talk more about exact meditation techniques to increase your attention span and your focus. And it's really, really great to have that. And I've noticed that the more Sanskrit that I memorize and the more that I use these tools, the more relaxed and calm and blissful that I feel. I've started to think of it as the bliss switch. <laughs> you can just switch it on at will. So... Um, it's well worth uh, learning how to do that. And if you'd like to, then go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VM and I will share with you all that I know so far based on actual practice. All right. So um, 
Hamzel says, I'm studying ancient history where there are a lot of Sanskrit words. Excellent, excellent. Um, yeah, the one sort of weakness in my current study is that I don't really know um, how well that I'm pr pronouncing what it is that I'm trying to memorize. Um, but the very good thing is that it's really sinking in quite, quite deeply. And so the more... Um, the more that I study, the more that I really understand why it is that they encourage you to actually work with the Sanskrit in those particular medita meditations. Harvinder says, I'm waiting for your next book. Excellent. Thank you. I, I can't wait to get it in everybody's hands. And thanks, Harvinder, too. You were a great supporter of the Memory Connection. Really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, the Memory Connection is currently not available, but we're going to put it back into available at some point in the future. Um, and it may be possible that we just will remake it with the new book. I don't know. Uh, still thinking it through. Uh, and if you want to be part of it, then definitely be on that webinar. But let's go on to talk about memorizing points in real time. So one great way to really stick with what you're consuming, the information that you're consuming, is, for example, with a podcast, go on Google Maps or whatever, the city you already know, and go for a walk. But before you go, create memory palaces that support a particular information, amount of information, that you will memorize as you walk along. I used to do this in Berlin all the time. So, you know, listening to a lot at that time, a lot of the Tim Ferriss show and uh, a lot of Sam Harris and just many, many podcasts in the world of, you know, running different kinds of things that help with the website. And I would just go and I would memorize stuff as I was walking along using street corners as the place to encode it. And this had the double whammy effect, was, which was when I heard a point, then I was able to actually remember what it was without having to stop all the time and, you know, put it in a notebook, which in the winter in Berlin, when the uh, Russische Peiche, the Russian whips of wind are coming through, <laughs> you don't want to be stopping and taking notes all the time. You just want to get your walk done and go. Uh, or you don't want to take a notebook like I was often going down to the gym with uh, my trainer Lars at the time and uh, oh, great memories there and just don't want to carry a bunch of stuff just go to the gym and get it done and the uh, mp3 player was more than enough so just paying attention at a greater detail because you're listening to memorize you're listening for the opportunity to encode something in your memory palace this is a super important way of extending your attention span, listening for things that are worth memorizing, and then having the actual memory palace to do it while you're walking. And walking is creating all kinds of wonderful chemicals and, and so forth. So give that a try. Wonderful, wonderful attention span, memory palace, concentration, increasing activity that you just win across the board. It doesn't have to be podcasts. It can also be audiobooks. But my preference for it is with uh, podcasts because they're generally contained to a smaller set of ideas, or you could think of each chapter as an individual podcast in a book. Could you do it with novels? Quite potentially, if you wanted to memorize plot points and character names and so forth. So that is another thing to try. Um, long form videos. So let's say you're watching two dudes on a stage uh, talking or in a studio room talking. You could work on just using the room they're in to memorize various points in the mise-en-scene. This is kind of in the virtual memory palace territory, but uh, not, in a, not in an unusually d difficult way. It wouldn't increase your cognitive demand in the way that a full-on virtual memory palace would. Uh, so that is something to give uh, your attention to. Then you can attend talks and use the lecture halls as as memory palaces and encode what they're saying uh, as they go along. There's a podcast and blog post all about the way that you can do this with note taking on the Magnetic Memory Method site at magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash note dash taking. And that's a very, very powerful thing. And what these all amount to is observing and practicing thinking out loud as you are engaged in encoding the information in memory palaces. This will increase your attention span. It will do wonders for your ability to focus and concentrate for longer and longer periods of time. So Rasmus is here. Hello, Rasmus. 
was just thinking about you the other day, actually. Good to see you. Thanks for saying hello. And uh, yeah, let me know if you're just joining us where you are in the world. Let me know what you're doing, what you're thinking, how things are going with your studies and your Memory Palace uh, practice. Hit the thumbs up if you haven't already. Get subscribed to this channel if you haven't already. And uh, if you're watching the replay, you can uh, chat down below. That would be fantastic. And I really appreciate uh, all the different conversations that uh, show up after on the, uh, the replays that are there for people. Um, so let's carry on and talk about this mirroring technique. When I have had a really bad attention span and an issue focusing, one of the things that I, has really helped me is to repeat in my mind what's being said by other people. And I've come to think of this as magnetic mirroring. And uh, this is a really wonderful thing to do, not only in conversations in real time, when you're really with people in a room, but also when you're listening to lectures, whether they're recorded lectures on an on a audio or on a video, or when you're actually in a lecture. If you want to focus in the lecture, then do it in your mind. So if the speaker is talking about, you know, well, when I was 15, I read Dostoevsky and I started with Crime and Punishment. Literally repeat that in your head. Well, when I was 15, I read Dostoevsky and I started with Crime and Punishment. You know, like you're just sort of mirroring it in your mind. This can get kind of tiring, but what it does is it practices your ability to be in real time with the speaker and stick with it and stay with it. And what I suggest that you do is have a kind of on-off sort of switch. So when you find yourself wandering, start doing it again. But do it just for a minute or two and then release. So it's, you know, like a lot of th things in, in life is you you start with some pressure and then you release. Start with some pressure and then you release. And you'll find that you just start naturally paying more attention. Same thing with reading. If you find yourself drifting off while you're reading, start reading out loud for just a couple of sentences and then go back to silent reading. Uh, that has, at least that has been very, very helpful for me. The other thing too, is that after you've read or heard things, work things out, work ideas out. I do it verbally. It used to be that I looked insane when I did this. I'd be walking around the streets talking to myself, oh yeah, well, you know, according to Umberto Echo, misinterpretation, blah, 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 blah. But then cell phones came along, and then Bluetooth came along, and then everybody's talking to themselves, and now these days they got invisible headphones and people just talk to themselves. So it's not a big deal. Uh, but work things out verbally, and that can really help you pay attention to a single topic. So if you're walking around, you're washing the dishes, you're in the shower, whatever the case may be, if you find your mind wandering, pick one of the study topics that you're focused on and just work things out verbally. And so... Maybe you read a three chapter, three chapters from a book. You just start talking to yourself. Well, in chapter one, I remember that such and such happened, and that is important because it connects to this thought, which was by somebody, and then move on to chapter two, and then weave it all together. And don't stop. Keep coming back to it until that you've gotten to the end of the summary and work things out verbally. And you can... Uh, you know, if you're watching some of these great debates between people like Jordan Peterson and Sam Harris and so forth, you can work out for yourself their two positions verbally in your mind and hold your attention span through as many of their differing points as you can possibly come up with. Highly recommend this. And uh, then uh, extend your verbal attention span practice as much as you can, as often as you can, by engaging in discussions with other people. And we'll talk about that as we go along, but you can also do it through writing. So you can extend discussions with people that you're never gonna meet or very unlikely to meet uh, by writing. And so this is a conversation that you can have. Um, let's check in with the chat here though. Rasmus has a question from Estonia. I have a question, it was trade, right? Was the word for tree that you had, had uh, mentioned some, some time ago. T-R-A with an umlaut D, if uh, memory serves. Okay, so Rasmus says, I have a question about confusing the languages. How do you keep similar languages separate, uh, like uh, Spanish and Portuguese? For me, it is Swedish and Danish. Well, there's a, there's a number of ways to do it, uh, but I guess the question is, are you doing the vocabulary memorization in memory palaces, or do you just mean in general? Uh, let me know more details about, about what you're doing. And... Uh, if, if I'm right that, uh, 
that trade was the word for sw for tree in Swedish, then uh, let me know what it is in Danish, and then maybe we can work that out. Physico says, great, Dr. Metivier. I thought I was the only one who discussed books out loud alone. No, far from it. <laughs> I think it's a, you know, like, if you feel worried that you're insane, then just go see it by, run it past the doctor. There's no shame in it. Just say, hey, I've been t talking out loud. Here's my take on, on mental illness, and this is something that uh, Deleuze and Guattari talk about in Anti-Oedipus. Essentially, their definition of meditation, or sorry, mental illness, is... Uh, is that if you're not able to contribute to society because of your wacky things that you do, then maybe it's legitimately a mental illness that isn't some sort of conspiracy. Uh, but by the same time, they say that uh, schizo uh, capitalism is a, essentially schizophrenic because it insists that you must be a contributor, a meaningful contributor to society. So I don't really know the answer. But at the end of the day, I think that if you're here and you are in active in the chat, you are a active contributor to society, so it's okay to speak out loud. But if you ever have any worries about it, just go run it past a medical professional, because I certainly am not one of them. <laughs> I have a PhD, but it is not in medicine or psychiatry. That said, I've gone, I've been psychoanalyzed, and apparently it worked because I feel pretty good and don't have really worries about this, that, or the other thing that I used to, so that's great. Um, can, sh can share anecdotal evidence, but run it past your doctor first. Uh, but yeah, t speaking out loud about books, I think is fine. Uh, Rasmus says, I'm f a fear of confusing these languages makes my mind wander. The mental chatter becomes super active. Right. Well, we're going to talk about that later. So stick around. Um, because chatter in your mind is something that you can reduce by using some of the techniques that we'll talk about by extending your attention span, working to attend, uh, extend your attention span and, uh, and, uh, and really, really focus on getting that skill mastered so that you quiet your mind, so you scrub out all this noise. And that's what I've been doing a lot, and that's what this webinar is all about. So if you haven't registered for it, go to magneticmarymethod.com forward slash VM get registered, join me, because we'll be diving real, real deep into memory uh, and, and meditation techniques, where they meet, where they combine, where to use them together, how to use them together to shut that noise off. We'll talk more about it today as well, but you don't want to miss this uh, webinar if you, can, if you can make it. So um, let's see here. But generally, Rasmus, remember this from Frank Herbert. Fear is the mind killer. Do whatever it takes to get rid of fear and do it as soon as possible. If, you know, as Tim Ferriss has said often, it, whatever is standing between you and the task is the task. And so if you're really getting caught up with things like fear and so forth, get rid of that. And memory technique and me memory work will, will definitely serve, but you gotta look at underlying issues as well. And some of the classic ones are that people are poisoning themselves with junk food, so, Junk food can make you really itchy and twitchy and irritated, and you might not have any fear at all. You, you just might have a body that is so full of inflammation, and your brain can be hugely inflamed, and you won't never, you'll never feel it as a, as a physical issue, because the brain apparently doesn't, doesn't feel, so you would never know, but you might be just totally suffering from an inflamed brain. And in that case, all of the memory techniques in the world are not going to really change that chemical state. You've got to do it through food, and you've got to do it through sleep, and you've got to do it through hydration, and you've got to do it through maybe some meditative practice. Ideally, a combination of all those things together. So again, that webinar is going to talk about the meditation aspect of everything at magneticmarymethod.com forward slash VM. Um, uh, Lisa Lisa is here. Hello, Lisa Lisa. I like that. Double Lisa. Um, hello. Thanks for saying hello. How can I use a memory palace to remember hieroglyphs? Please let me know. What are hieroglyphs? Um, I'm going to look it up just to uh, see for myself, but I want to know what you think they are or what you say they are or what they are for you because... Oh, hieroglyphics. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, in what language are hieroglyphics called hieroglyphs? Or is that in Egyptian? 
That would be cool to know. And if so, which Egyptian? Like Egyptian Arabic or what? Please say more. And generally, guys, please be more expansive in uh, the chats. That's always useful. Um, and do you have a memory palace? Uh, at least one. Then uh, that will make it a lot easier for you to figure out the answer. Because um, otherwise, it's just general stuff. So go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash YT if you don't know how to create effective memory palaces for things like hieroglyphs. Um, so Rasmus says a tree in Swedish is trade and in Danish it is tray. So is that tray? Am I pronouncing that correct? The, if so, uh, Abraham Lincoln, what did he say? Uh, you know, if I have to cut down some trees, I'll spend four hours, <laughs> four hours sharpening the axe and two hours cutting down the trees. So if it's trade and then you reduce it to tray, Abraham Lincoln is cutting the D off of a tree. Uh, a, a word shaped, a tree shaped as the word, uh, and, and away you go. You just cut the D off of that word, and that w would help you remember. And maybe there's some ceremonial Danish clothing or something like this that uh, he's wearing while he's doing this. And he just, next word, next word, next word, next word. Just work with it. Learn magnetic imagery if you don't already know how, and uh, take it word for word. And then use the rest of the big five of learning which is reading, writing, speaking, and listening in ways that enhance your memory and read, write, speak, and listen out of memory. That's the big five. And you'll, you'll have it done before you know it. Um, Floor is here. Hello, Floor. Thanks for saying hello. Uh, looking for a worthy struggle because fear is always going to be there. I'm not sure I agree that fear is always going to be there. I actually think you can scrub it out. And as crazy as that sounds... I think you can, and 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 I, I've had some interesting experiences around that. I'm not entirely sure, but I think you can, and I think it's pretty clear and obvious how that it can be done. Because I've been having these experiences, and I don't, th I don't for a second suppose that fear wouldn't ever come back. But there is a neat kind of practice that you can do that will get you pretty close, and it'll get you pretty close pretty quickly, I think. But I can't say for sure. And more on that is coming up on the webinar at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VM. And the guy to read, really, if you uh, want to check it out, is Gary Weber, Happiness Beyond Thought. And getting beyond thought is how you get beyond fear. And one of the ways to get beyond thought is to understand that anything that's appearing in consciousness is a thought, right? Now, fear may have a, a biological state, but then you start to have thoughts about that, and then those thoughts are usually worse than the biological th state. They accelerate it, and they then make the biological state worse than it is. So there's state management. It's a real thing. It's not, not goofy woo-woo science, even though some people certainly uh, put a lot of goofy woo-woo into it. But the trick, I think, is that you need to put yourself into a ongoing state of being a manager of your ongoing state and live your life in a way that reduces the opportunity for anything fearful to even enter it. Now, there's a guy named Robert Langs who I underwent psychoanalysis from, and he talked about the three kinds of fear. And that helped me a lot in earlier parts of my life that I think is really starting to pay off now, which was to learn to distinguish between predator anxiety, prey anxiety, and uh, existential anxiety. Those were the three anxieties that he really was, uh, was interested in helping you scrub out of your mind. And you could do it in particular ways by understanding unconscious communication, which is one of the reasons why you want to be very, very good at listening to what people say, as we were just talking about with magnetic mirroring. Really pay attention to what they're saying. And then you're able to see the things that cause predator anxiety or prey anxiety or existential anxiety in you and you can nip them off at the bud so that they don't affect you. Another way of thinking about this is, you know, if you are watching the news and you start to have a real pessimistic outlook on the world and it gets worse and worse and worse, well, it's just because you're feeding yourself all this stuff and you're not really aware of how it's triggering your predator anxiety, your prey anxiety, and your existential anxiety more and more and more, more aggressively, the more you get into the vortex loops. So you just got to replace that stuff with more positive things. 
and really work on state management, but preemptive state management, which is one of the things that meditation does for you. And so again, I will invite you to the upcoming webinar at magneticmarymethod.com forward slash VM. And this is going to be a great opportunity for you to be scrubbing your mind of all that stuff because you'll be aware of these different anxieties. Now, there may be more than three anxieties. Those are the three that he talked about. But, you know, as they say in German, all the guten Dinge sind dry. And if you could just focus on three things, those would be the ones that I think you ought to uh, focus on. So I um, uh, hope that helps you. We'll talk a little bit more about that because I've got some stuff from, you know, uh, that in our little notes for today's show. And speaking of today's show, if you want to support the show, go to magneticmarymethod.com forward slash YT, get the course. And if you want to get another additional video, go to magneticmarymethod.com forward slash swag and let me see a picture of you with something from the store and we'll send you a free video uh, that you're going to love. Because uh, it'll help you with creating memory palaces at a much higher level. And there's a pretty hefty discount on there. And so it's not like a big thing. Uh, but it it uh, is a great way of me helping you further with learning memory techniques. So Mr. Space says, thank you for your helpful advice. Thank you, Mr. Space, and thank you all for showing up. Oh, Daqua is here. All right. Hello, Daqua. Great to see you. And Bo, this is the first time you're here, but I, in, in anticipation that you would come, I have this prepared. This was from Daqua. Thank you so much for this. Really appreciate it. And thank you for the trees. Really appreciate that. Um, really, really great. And this is uh, Sequoia, who was the inventor of this, uh, this alphabet that you see here, which is the Cherokee alphabet. And really, really beautiful. I'll try and get that closer for you. Isn't that great? And uh, really, uh, really nice uh, seashell stamps. Well chosen. Really appreciate that. So I, was, I had this nearby just for when you showed up to say thank you, because I really appreciate that. It's very beautiful. And uh, when people ask about the address, it's on magneticmarymethod.com. And uh, yeah, <laughs> send stuff if you like. <laughs> um, I like cups. Thank you, Julie. Um, and there's a reason I like cups, and that's because they're a very powerful memory tool, which is what I send you when I see an image of you with some swag from the store at magneticmarymethod.com forward slash swag, S-W-A-G. All right, Julie says, beautiful card. Oh, yes, it is. This is just amazing. I, this is the kind of thing, like, if I didn't have a green screen here behind me, I would love to have as a as a giant poster or something and then really learn it. And I, I'm I'm really interested in, in picking up at some point in my life an indigenous language, and it just is beautiful, and I want to I learn so much in life. But this particular syllabary is a, is a very profound and interesting one, and I'm sure that there's great things to uh, to learn from it. And I'm going to take that opportunity to do so. It's just a, a great blessing. Um, and I've heard this name Sequoia before, so it's neat how some things echo throughout life. Okay, so Lisa says, sorry, I mean Chinese characters. Great, so Chinese characters, you know, characters, I do use a memory palace for them, but I use a process called Camp Mist which brings together memory palaces with mind maps and the major method so that you get the tones. And that is uh, perhaps a topic for a different day, but it is all in the masterclass if you want to go and investigate and explore those topics. Sandeep is here. Hello, Sandeep. Which system is better, Dominic or the major, to remember? Uh, well, you'd have to ask Dominic uh, and think about it in terms of what your desired outcome is. And he could advise you if that is better. And, you know, don't necessarily pester him by email. Just support his work, buy his book, read it if you haven't already, and then experiment and explore to see if it's getting your outcome. The reason why that I have preferred a 00 to 99 based out of the major is because I find that it's the least arbitrary and least cognitively demanding way of doing things. But I don't compete, and I have competed and I can tell you that there's rhyme to the reason of why certain people use different systems that do evolve, involve an arbitrary association to the numbers. I just don't see it being the way to go for most everyday people 
but I'm not all everyday people. So it's really uh, on, on the individual learner to explore the various options, put in some time in learning and exploring them, and try not to think in terms of better. Think of what will I use? What will I show up for? What will I spend time on and master? And let go of the need for certainty. And, you know, don't expect a straight answer from anybody who's honest because the answer is in your practice. It's in what you're going to do and what your outcome is. So if you say more, Samdeep, about what you're trying to do, then I might be able to advise a little bit more. But at the end of the day, that is really my, my advice is have a, have a particular outcome. Try both. See where you get. My prediction would be that unless you're competing, and even if you're competing, um, the major will will maybe serve you best. Uh, I don't know. Different people do different things. Um, as far as I know, Alex Mullen has used the major uh, for his approach, but he's really put in the practice and and done some innovations, particularly with cards that enable that that level of speed. And I do believe that it's based on the major. And uh, you can go and listen to the interview with Alex uh, about that. I've reached out to Dominic a few times to be on the show, and maybe that will come together in the near future, and then we can, you know, we, we can ask him uh, more about it. But he's put out so many books that you know you can uh, you can definitely check out what he says in those books to consult with that. And ultimately, no matter what is said in all the books in the world, the real answers are in your practice. So I hope that helps your uh, helps you out there. And if there's something, if there's a barrier between you and just diving in, picking one of them and spending a sufficient amount of time to to master one of them, let me know what that is because maybe we can find a way for you. So physical says, I think Rasmus, that you can work in seeing your thoughts as just thoughts in the brain. Just say it's just a thought. I am me, and this is interrupting my silence. Breathe deeply while you talk. Great. That's a great thing to try, Physico. And thank you for suggesting that. Essentially, I, I would reverse it a bit, though. Instead of saying, I am me, ask yourself, to whom is this occurring, right? To where? And where is it happening in, in, in the me that is experiencing this? Who is that me? Um, and the reason why I say that, and it's really the teaching of non-duality and self-inquiry, which uh, I've first learned about in Happiness Beyond Thought, is you're going to have a difficult time finding the you that you think exists, right? And that is a very powerful thing to discover. And that is the way you escape fear. And ultimately, it's the way you escape thought or, or unwarranted thought. And there's different kinds of thought, like there's task thought, right, which is just procedural. It's not going to cause panic. It's not going to cause fear. It's not going to cause any pain or suffering or any of that jazz. And so you don't really even have to worry about eliminating that. It's just this kind of like me, me, me thought, I, I, I thought. All of that stuff can go in a, in a large degree. You don't really need it. It's a given for one thing. Whatever it is that you are is inside of this sack of meat. And it just seems to go wherever the sack of meat goes, right? And so you don't need to constantly refer to it as I or me, right? It's just just this unit that's moving around. And so you just ask yourself, who to whom is this experience happening, right? And uh, you, you want to get into this, and uh, that's more of what we'll be talking about in... Uh, in this webinar at magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash VM uh, on meditation and memory techniques. But you'll train yourself to stop taking these I and me thoughts so seriously. And in my experience so far, you can scrub them out significantly to the point that even when they appear, they just don't bother you. Um, so I really appreciate that physical, but I would just reverse it. I would reverse it and not say I am me, but rather ask, who is the me that I think I am and where exactly is this person? And you'll train yourself to see that you are more like just this constant changing thing of desires and ideas and thoughts that are so unfixed that you can't really legitimately call it a one thing. And yet you treat it as if it's this coherent and cohesive whole. And that is ruinous to your attention span because it keeps changing and shifting. But inside of you, there's something that is stable and still and doesn't change. 
And when you can find that and when you can focus on that, your attention span goes through the roof. So it's really, really uh, important. So Physical says this helps a bunch. Andrew is here. Hello, Andrew. Listening from McKay, Queensland. Well, I'm in Brisbane, so not too far away, I guess. Uh, finding your podcast very helpful over the last month. Big help with mental clarity. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andrew. I really appreciate that. And uh, wow, well, uh, I'm thinking maybe in the near future of doing a meetup here in Brisbane. So uh, let me know if that would be of interest to you. What kinds of times would make sense if it is. And uh, that would be cool to meet you. Um, Dequa says, sweet, thank you, and you're welcome. Chat locked this in, could not access at the time. Oh, well, uh, sorry if the chat, I hope it's not locked uh, anything that we've been doing, but uh, thank you very much again. Wonderful. Um, but yeah, um, let's carry on here uh, with some ideas about extending your memory by writing from memory. And if you're just joining us, let me know where you are in the world. Hit the thumbs up if you haven't already. Let the robots know that humans are paying attention. <laughs> it's a key survival strategy on the internet these days. And if you like this kind of stuff, do let me know through the chat and through comments later. If you're watching the replay and the thumbs up button, that lets me know that I'm not talking into outer space, even though I am in outer space, apparently. And uh, But more importantly, it lets the uh, robots know. And that is becoming increasingly important as... Uh, all kinds of goofy stuff are happening on the internet these days in terms of the, the them, the, the royal they making decisions about what you should or shouldn't see on the internet according to algorithms and stuff like that. So always interact with what you want to keep seeing. There are certain things that I didn't interact with and it just like disappeared and I had to actively go seek it. And it's just like, oh my God, the algorithms have scrubbed it out of my awareness simply because I wasn't interacting with it according to some goofy law that they've written into the code. Um, maybe not a bad thing. Triggers some memory here and then, but nonetheless, I would have preferred it just to stay the way that it was. <laughs> but they keep changing stuff, which is the nature of, uh, of things, to be sure. Um, all right, so one of the things that can really, really help is, let's say now you're at the point where you're practicing your attention span, you're memorizing stuff actively in real time, whether it's from podcasts or audiobooks or lectures or books while you're reading or conversations that you're having, write a little summary in writing, like literally with a pen and pencil. This will help you process the information deeper. It'll get it through a different brain representation system and it'll actually externalize it into the world and then you'll see it from your own perspective outside of your head which will then cause you to actually perceive it differently and you'll have a kind of mental rotation from a different perspective automatically just by doing this. How do you do it? Ideally, with a piece of paper and a pencil. Um, it could be a pen, but I'm just going to recommend pencil because <laughs> I think that pencil really has this wonderful organicness to it and also if you... If you want to think of pencil as a kind of um, impermanent thing that you you're, you're not necessarily going to uh, be able to ever read it in the in the future because it's going to fade and so forth and it just has this presence to it as a result. This is just my own preference. I don't have any science behind it, but that's just kind of where my thoughts go uh, with that. The other cool thing is you can email yourself your summaries and uh, you can. Uh, email them to others if you have a discussion group, which ideally you should, and forums and comments. And one of the things I love, and I put uh, Maricella here, she's always writing nice little summaries of what happened in, in the YouTube videos and so forth, which is, you know, great uh, in terms of helping the channel be more prevalent in, in, in the eyes of the robots. But it's great for her memory just to take a minute to type out the, uh, the, the material that was learned and other people have done it as well but Maricella does it the most consistently and so that is um, very much appreciated but also something that, that I feel is something that you know is most beneficial for her and for anybody who does it so writing summaries is great and it's a way of just focusing on your memory what was in there and then focusing on the transformation of your thoughts as you reconsider them from another perspective which then lays the groundwork for more paying attention to what you think and what you have thought along the journey. 
because you've put down some soil and you've been you've trodden this territory you've trodden it now by the way that you've consumed it through your ears and eyes you've trodden it by the way you've memorized it into the deep chemical structures of your neural networks in your brain and now you've had some time to consider it and maybe you verbally processed it by talking out loud to yourself as you're walking around or in the shower or whatever you do and now you process it in actual writing and this is where you can start to create diction this is where you can start to create fluidity of expression this is where you can think about, are these words the crispest words that I could possibly use here and start to formulate a better path towards expression and elocution in your life through writing, which will affect how you speak. It's also your opportunity to do any, any research or that you could peg this moment for when you're going to do research and maybe find some exact quotes that you want to memorize exactly. And that can be the time that you do that and I highly recommend that you do not copy and paste them, but you actually write them out yourself in your own hand. And if you're going to use computers for this, that you type them out and process them. Retyping information is, is a really, really great way of understanding it from a different perspective. William Goldsmith has a great video on his presentation at the, at the actual White House about the role of retyping in creativity and how important it is to retype different kinds of texts for different purposes in life so check that out just just look that up and uh, you'll have a great uh, a great bit of viewing there and uh, really really like that that uh, that talk his school of uncreativity as a, a means of being more creative so I suggest that and then you know really um, really write for for some huge outcomes huge outcomes but do it in a way where you withhold judgment on what it is that you're writing and be tentative about your conclusions because a lot of people cast judgment on topics without acknowledging the fact that the the final judgment is always yet to come we live in history we live in in a present moment where more data is accumulating and entering human memory all the time and if you're willing to reserve judgment and be tentative and say my conclusion for now is this, but I am open to new information that will cause me to change this and even put in writing what you think could possibly make change in the future. You're not only focusing your attention span very, very closely on what's called critical thinking, but you're also priming your mind to pay attention to things that you wouldn't pay attention to otherwise because you're just simply not making this field in which it's possible to pay attention because you don't have any future outlook. You don't have space in your mind and your memory and you're not priming yourself because you've cast final judgment. So I put here contributing to the discussion that's going on through book reviews and you can, you can think of book reviews as uh, just reviews that you leave on Amazon, for example. But if you're going to leave reviews, don't do this sort of stuff where you're like, yay or naying it thumbs upping it or thumbs downing it with your stars, actually contribute to the dialogue, contribute to the discussion, try and understand what the author is trying to do. And if you have criticisms, again, think about how that, that knowledge that you've just placed in your mind is laying the groundwork for that future and just talk to the author and, and think about, give them the thoughts of what they need to pay attention to in the future in the same way that you also have been given the opportunity by that author to think about a, a different kind of future and a more wide open future simply by how that you engage there. So writing is a great way to do that and being engaged in, in criticism uh, through the form of reviews or book reviews is a great way of doing that. And uh, it's, it's an, another way of practicing attention span because you're actively suppressing this need for the final uh, nail in the coffin, but rather you're being part of the discussion and you're actually helping to create the discussion because this is what dialogue and discourse is, is being a contributor to human knowledge, but in a way that you have withhold, withheld final judgment. Very, very important and it's very good for your attention span. All right. So, Physical says, I'm very pleased to hear your opinion, Dr. Mativier, but your approach is not ideal to me because I think I like to think about the existence of the human and society, and this makes my attention go out of the subject. That's why I don't use this now. Maybe you can help with this problem. I'm not sure that it is a problem, and I don't know, um, 
I don't know why it would not be ideal to you uh, if you haven't tried it, but I appreciate your reluctance to do so, and you will want to think about the role of skepticism in your life, which the true skeptic tries things before they rule them out. So um, I don't think that uh, any of this denies or flies in the face of the, de the existence of the human in society. I think it rather supports it, uh, quite frankly, and I think it supports it in a much higher level. But as you wish. Um, but I don't know how to help you otherwise because I can't think of any other... Uh, thing to do other than perhaps go and explore things like psychoanalysis and and other forms of exploration of the self, but they all kind of lead to the same thing, which is that we're all casting the illusion that an individual I exists when it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. It's not there. It's not real. And one of these things that you'll understand if you start to contribute to discussions like you are now is that there's push and there's pull, and there's this sort of tug and war, tug of war sometimes. But where is that tug of war? Where is it actually taking place? It's only taking place in one place, which is in the chemical bath in your head, and in the chemical bath of the heads of others. And the more that you are the captain of your own chemical bath, right? Then the more you're just untouched on your journey. And you're better able to think about others and how they are touched by their chemical baths because they're clearly not doing the work that you are in terms of increasing your focus and your attention span through a regular and consistent practice of the things we're talking to about today in addition to meditation. So take it or leave it, but I don't think that anybody should write it off without having paid their dues and really tried it to see what, what, it, what we're talking about here. And uh, there are many, many, many other solutions, and they're all great to try. But at the end of the day, I think if you get a high enough bird's eye view, you'll see that pretty much every philosophical and religious tradition is pushing at this, what I'm suggesting today. And they'll, they, you'll get there one way or the other from them all, because there's not so many ideas under the sun. And so you can skip to the head of the line. I'm not 100% convinced or, or, or need to be convinced that this is the one idea, but it certainly is so that rejecting it without trying it is a way of locking yourself out of the great and wondrous things that there are there to explore. So um, that can be a problem uh, relative to what your goals are, and so give that, give that some thought. Julie says, excellent tip about transferring your thoughts into a song. I love pencils too, and I make it a point to purchase writing implements that are very special to me. It creates a sacredness to my work. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And this is, you know, more, um, more fuel to the, to the self-inquiry line of things is because this interaction that you're having with what's there is leading you to be fused with the present moment and to really have that object in, the, in your consciousness to direct your attention to that present moment. And then it's in that moment, likely, you can confirm this or deny it, but it's in that moment that your attention span is at its fineness, fine, fineness, finest, finest, that's the word I'm looking for, because that's precisely the moment that the I is no longer present. It is fused with the object of, let's say, sacred intent in this case, which is the object helping to create the work, fusing with the work, with you, whatever you are, fusing with the work, in that moment without the I present. As Gary Weber often says, you know, <laughs> life is better without me. My life is better without me. And this is one of the reasons why we seek sacred objects is to get that oppressive and consistent I, 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 me, me, me out of the picture because it's useless and it's not contributing anything. So, um, and what it is contributing is usually pain and suffering because of the fixation on the I as an object. Right? And this can be very, very difficult and challenging to wrap your head around. But everything that appears in consciousness, every thought, is in some sense an object. Right? And so the more you are tying your sense of the I, which is an object, to other objects, the more suffering you're going to create. But the more you can let that go and release it, then the less suffering you're going to create. 
And this is a very, very good thing. And it, it relates to this suppression of the need for final answers and for certainty, because it's the I that needs answers and certainties. It's the ego that needs that. But your being, that blissful thing that you really are, that is deeper than name and form, as Eckhart Tolle puts it, is so wonderfully expansive and completely without need of grasping onto objects like the eye or anything like this, uh, even if they are helpful for helping achieve that state beyond those objects, uh, as, as are these processes we're talking about today. So in terms of expanding your, your writing, of course, writing is best fed by lots of reading. So read a ton. Read in order to create connections on a journey without a destination. Try, I mean, we're going to talk about goals, and goals are very, very important, but you want to kind of um, read on a journey without necessarily having a destination and seeing what kinds of endless connections you can come up with. And you attenuate and focus your attention span and increase your attention span by having this sort of open-ended reading and not trying to just get the exam, you know, the information for the exam or for the test or the quiz or pub night or whatever it is that you're doing with trivia and so forth. But you're reading very, very specifically as a journey of fulfilling yourself and of making it possible for you to actually contribute at a higher level. So you create a perfect circle between the world and yourself as part of a journey rather than uh, anything anything that has a destination and just keep reading you know I, I think of it as the as a hydra every book should produce at least one other book you know and uh, by reading is dangerous in that sense because you just keep finding that there's more books to read but you know Nelson Mandela said I climb the mountain and all I see are other mountains to climb well, exactly exactly there should be no end that should be such a moment of bliss and joy same thing with books and some people may feel frustrated by this. They may be like, oh my goodness, all, I, all that happens when I read is I find more things to read. But you then just need to see where you're going to go, what, what attracts you, what will supplement where you're at, and just keep adding and adding and adding because this is a way of actually increasing the return on investment from the initial book that you read, getting more out of it, building more foundations in your mind and your memory as you move forward and if any, if ever, oh, that's the final word on a book, well, then be very, very suspicious. There are some books that I'm reading right now, and uh, they, their Achilles heel is that they think that they have the final word on a particular topic. This is a very dangerous position for them to take, not only because history isn't over yet, but just simply because they're using language, and language is itself a changing thing. So how could they possibly have the final word on something when they're using something as malleable as language. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah, I get where they're coming from, but it doesn't make sense. And it's, at the end of the day, not really intellectually honest uh, to, to do that. And these people are smart enough to know better. But we won't name names of what that particular <laughs> set of books are, but uh, they're just too sure of themselves, and it's ultimately not scientific. Uh, and the end is never in sight uh, so far. So... Suppress the need for final answers for certainty and so forth. That'll be very, very useful for you. Rasmus says, I want to learn IPA for languages, but for me it is hard to remember what sound that is associated with a symbol, and also at times I forget which was which. All right, well, you know, work on not forgetting which is which. Figure out how you would describe and define in words that specific problem. Figure out a bunch of examples, and then work more on solving those examples. Really, really uh, quite simple and important to, to start thinking from the level of specificity because there's a lot of generalization here, and I know you're just in a chat and so forth, but in your own private work with what we're talking about today, reading, writing, speaking, and listening as a way of extending your attention span, really dig deep through reading, writing, speaking, and listening. What is this issue? And... Uh, you'll find many, many answers to what kinds of exercises you need to focus on in order to improve. So that uh, is something to, to focus on there, Erasmus. Um, now, in terms of how people read these days, they're often reading with 
plus open tabs, that's no way to get the job done. You want to hold your mind on a single reading goal and you want to see things through. Read books from beginning to end and by the same token, have discernment when to read books in different ways. So Roland Barthes in the book SZ, he really points out something fundamental, which is that just because a book might be written for you to read it from beginning to end it does not require you to read it from beginning to end. And so this is where we've talked before on this show about priming and reading out of order for particular outcomes. And so you want to have a steady reading goal, but not necessarily treat all books equally and read every word. My uh, former wife used to have a wonderful badge uh, that hung on the wall that was previously from a record label that she worked for, and it said, Life is too short for boring music. And likewise with books, but by the same token, sometimes you really got to pay your diligence and or do due diligence and read those books even if they are boring because you need to know what's in them. You need to know what's there, but not always. And sometimes you can come back to them later after you've read something else. So there's lots of examples where books are just like too much of a heavy slog at, at a particular time. So you go and read something a little simpler, and then you come back to it, and then those chapters are suddenly not so boring anymore. That can, uh, that can be the case. Um, <laughs> Rasmus says, this is such a tough task to focus completely on one task. I have 20 tabs open pretty much all the time too. Well, there's solutions for this, right? So for example, you can pull individual tabs out and isolate them. You can uh, get uh, something that's called one funnel, I think it's called, or one tab. Um, one tab. One tab for Chrome lets you collapse all your open tabs into a single tab. And it's kind of like advanced bookmark or whatever, but you can just scoop them all up and get them out of your face. Uh, but generally, print stuff out that you need to read. Don't read online if you can avoid it. I know that not everybody can, but having 20 tabs o open is just a recipe for disaster. Have one tab open. And, you know, there's, there's real virtue to bigger screens because a lot of us are we're competing with smaller and smaller screens and this is this is not great but if you just have one screen open with what it is that you need to um, what you need to focus on and then one screen for your notes if you're going to do it that way and just have them fill the field and nothing else and just resist opening new tabs resist taking um, uh, the Google effect, like, oh, I'll just look that up on Google, right? Every word that you don't understand, every fact that you think, ooh, ooh I got to know more about that. Make a note that you need to know more about it. Don't do it now. And another strategy, if you're writing, forgive my uh, big nozzle in the, in the screen here, but I've always used this. So this is a life-saving focus and concentration attention span device, and it's got Yoda on it for a reason, because Yoda as you know, says do or do not. There is no try. <laughs> and uh, what's beautiful about this is that, you know, I write outlines for books and stuff, and every time there's the temptation to have the outline open on the screen and then have the writing on a, another part of the screen. It's not a good policy. The better policy is to print the outline out, open up this little hatch here, uh, it goes this way, and get something with a hard back. See how we do this? And put the outline in here and go somewhere where there is no internet and write just free from any other screen open. And there's something called cold turkey writer. You put in however many words it is that you want to pump out and you've got your outline printed out here. I recommend this for essays. I used to do this with essays uh, even before the internet was such a huge issue. And I've carried this around with me all around the world to get it done and not be interrupted. So do not have your outlines on uh, the screen. That's a great way to kill your attention span for writing. This is a great way to extend your attention span. And then plan breaks, you know, don't, don't just sit there and write like a maniac, but set, uh, set milestones. And, and Hemingway always had that good idea that, you know, stop when you know when you still know what you're going to write the next day. That's a good tip um, to, to keep in mind. 
And again, like Yoda is on here, not by mistake, but to remind me of that epic advice that do or do not, there is no try. So I don't try to write books. I just write them. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the way it is. And this uh, book uh, that I'm inviting you to uh, talk about on uh, this webinar at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VM is uh, the first time I'm ever, ever doing that. And uh, the first meeting with you, with some of you, I don't know if anybody here was there. Um, it was really great. Uh, we got lots of ideas for what should be in this book. And so we're going to go further now that the outline is complete. And if you want to join us, go to magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VM to get registered. Um, and I'll, let's see if I can put that link in the chat for you in case that you just like to click instead of uh, uh, type. By the way, if you're just joining us now on this live stream, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. If you have any questions, like everybody has already been doing some great questions, um, feel free to join in and uh, be active. So that's magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VM to register for that webinar. All right. So Physical says, I think connecting some example words to the symbol helps remembering and the memory palace should help too yeah definitely um you just gotta uh, so much of the work of using memory techniques is just figuring out where you are with the practice and then figuring out what it is you need to do to improve your abilities and then doing what it is need what's needed to improve and then going back and assessing where you are with your abilities figuring out what it is you need to improve, and then doing what it is that you need to improve. Um, and so just as with reading, you want to hold your mind steady on a single reading goal. With memory improvement, you want to hold your mind on a single reading goal, and or a memory goal, and continue to memorize and memorize and memorize and memorize and improve your practice and improve your practice. I have to do this all the time. I'm memorizing Sanskrit now, and I've got to assess it and just think, oh, I took a, uh, I took a shortcut here, and I, I shouldn't have taken a shortcut there, so now i got to go practice making sure that I don't take shortcuts, and how do I do that? Well, I do some cards, and I do some more Sanskrit, and I feel that need to take shortcuts, and that's the moment I catch myself and say, no, 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 that's what needed to be encoded, because when I woke up yesterday, you were stretching for it, and you didn't have it, and why? Well, you thought you would get away with it. Well, guess what? You didn't. So, you know, and this is an ongoing sort of thing. And it's a beautiful thing so long as you stick with the actual practice and you hold yourself to achieving those outcomes based on a continual reassessment of where you are. And don't think for a second that this is somehow unique to memory. It's the same for writing. Read Stephen King on writing. You'll learn so much about how to have better habits and goals and uh, really stick to things with consistency and use writing to effectively increase your attention span. The, going to the gym is the same thing. It's a constant reassessment of where you are, tracking how much you're lifting, how much you know, how many reps you're doing, how many sets, et cetera, et cetera. This is, this is nothing unique, and it's the same thing in learning. Keeping a, a, a record of what you're reading, how much you've read, and so forth. People now just relegate it to the history but when I was in university, like I had a shoebox filled with index cards, just noting what were the books, you know, and, and some bibliographical information around them. And it's just very, very powerful to have. You can, you can really, really do a lot for yourself by keeping a journal of what it is that you're doing. Even if you memorize it, keep a journal anyway. It's very, very powerful. And it's a great way of increasing your attention span over time to have a real solid sense of the library in your mind and how that library has relations and interconnections to other things. And that's why we ponder what, we, what we've memorized and we spend time reflecting on what we've memorized because it helps us make those connections when we go through the information. So Rahel is here from Sweden. Hello, Rahel. Great name. Great, uh, great to have you here. Thanks for saying hello. All right, so one of the things too is you want to bring understanding and memorizing together in real time and future time. So sort of picked this up already, but as you're as you're memorizing and and, and reading 
and understanding things, you can set the stage for other things that you're going to do in the future, such as thinking about the other books that you might read that connect to this. Or instead of, you know, oh, I'll look it up right now, setting the stage for the additional research you need to do later and then adding it in after you've completed the initial goal. So you're bringing your understanding together in real time and future time and you're actually crafting the future that you're going to follow. So um, that's a, a great, great strategy. Um, thank you, Rasmus, for being here. That was great. Another thing about reading that I wanted to mention is something called Sans, Sans Forgetica, or Sans Forgetica. Um, so Australian researchers, it says here, have developed a new tool that could help students cramming for exams, a font that helps readers remember information. Melbourne-based RMIT University's Behavioral Business Lab and Design School teamed up to create Sans Forgetica, which they say uses psychological and design theories to aid memory retention. About 400 university students have been involved in a study that found a small increase in the amount participants remembered 57% of text written in Sans Forgetica compared with 50% in a plain aerial. Typography lecturer Stephen Bannum said the font had an unusual seven degree back slant to the left and gaps in each letter. And you, you, got, you can look this up and you can see what, what, what they're talking about with these gaps in the letters. The mind will naturally seek to complete those shapes and so by doing that it slows the reader and triggers memory. Senior marketing lecturer Yannicka Blijeven said the concept of desirable difficulty underpinned the font's design. When we want to learn something and remember it, it's good to have a little bit of an obstruction added to that learning process because if something is too easy, it doesn't create a memory trace. If it's too difficult, it doesn't leave a memory trace either, so you need to look for the sweet spot. This is essentially the challenge frustration curve that they're talking about here. Um, and this idea of desirable difficulty is something that people who go to the gym deliberately create in order to experience muscle growth and so forth. Um, the font was designed with, a year 12, with year 12 students cramming for exams in mind, but could also be used to help people studying foreign languages and elderly people grappling with memory loss. Billy Javins is keen to test the font in other contexts such as proofreading. Bannum, who has created about 20 fonts, said the typeface would be best used for short texts. God, no, you wouldn't want novels printed in it, he said. It would probably induce a headache. <laughs> well, I've looked at one sentence, and it was headache-inducing, that's for sure. <laughs> the font took about six months to develop, and there were three different versions tested. Sans Forgetica is avail available free to download as a font and Chrome browser extension at sansforgetica.rmit. So check that out if you're interested. I am divided. I can see where they're going, but... I don't think this is the kind of obstruction I would recommend students put in front of themselves, although it is an interesting one, and I wanted to mention it for you all today. So carrying on, the next thing you want to do after you're you know, consuming information better, memorizing it in real time, is to focus on speaking better. And so some of the ways that you can do this is memorize poetry, memorize quotes, memorize speeches, uh, even memorize jokes. But I would recommend if you're going to memorize jokes, memorize either a series of jokes or very long jokes so that you're not practicing short attention span, but rather more oration, oratory style jokes. And then, of course, find opportunities to discuss uh, and, and speak out loud and speak out loud to an audience. And that, that's very, very powerful. So discussion groups are great for that. Meetup.com. Often you'll find something in your area. If not, create something and uh, you'll meet more people to discuss with. And uh, another thing for attention span that you may want to uh, consider is stuff that you can do at the end of the day or in the night. So let's have a look at this. You can memorize your dreams, for example, and we have a course in the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass all about dreams and how to memorize them. Uh, you can also journal at the night and the morning and plan and memorize your learning sessions times and locations. Uh, so writing out what you're going to do tomorrow, when you're going to do it, where you're going to do it, and so forth. This will cause you to have a little bit of attention span practice by charting out your future and planning. And then it's much more likely that you'll go and do those things by planning it out. And then, of course, if you really want to take it next level, put your to-do list in a memory palace and there's multiple ways to do that if you have a magnetic calendar and so forth in your mind, then you can do it that way. 
but really, really put some time into planning. And then just deliberately try for a couple months telling yourself that you'll remember your dreams and you'll write them down and then see what happens. And then you'll have a little morning focus and attention span increasing exercise where you'll exercise your memory by trying to catch back some of those episodes. And those episodes are very, very powerful for helping you be more engaged with mental imagery of different kinds, different sensations. So that's very powerful. And uh, let's talk a bit about attention span for mindset. So one of the most important things that you can do is really, really eliminate learned helplessness and catch it when it happens. So a lot of people, they don't really understand the Feynman technique and essentially this is trying to answer everything on your own before asking for help. And I suggest that you also document everything that you do before going to ask for help so that you can show your teacher what it is that you did and eliminate the possibility that you don't actually have a problem. You just haven't tried enough on your own to explore what it is that you're going to end up having to do on your own anyway. So this is really, really important. And then if you still go and see the teacher, they're able to help you at a much higher level because they can simply see what it is you've tried to do on your own. And they're able to say, ah, yeah, I did that and I tried that and here's what I discovered and, you know, tweak it this way. But if you haven't done that groundwork, they'll never be able to do that. So general questions, get general answers, but specific questions based on experience can get some very laser targeted answers. And actually they're never questions anyway, very long. They become dialogues, they become discussions. And you'll notice that happens on these live streams where there's a shorthand that you develop when you've taken action and you're actually presenting what you're doing and just looking for guidance based on being on the path as opposed to just trying to get some tip or trick or hack or whatever when you're not even on the path. That's just curiosity. And you know what curiosity did to the cat, right? Uh, be on the path and, and eliminate learned helplessness. Sniff it out like the wild, nasty animal that it is and chase it out because it'll ruin so much. And, and this is uh, not anything that I've been free from. I have to do it even to this day, hunt it out, because it comes up. It always comes up. The brain is designed to look for shortcuts. And then you just got to think, did I really try myself? Did I really before, you know, getting on the phone and telling the sob story, you know, of uh, this, that, and the other thing? And uh, it, 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 you'll surprise yourself if you start looking for it in your life, just how often it comes up. And then you scrub it out and, and, and chase it out. It's very, very important. The other thing, too, is that teachers are really, really important. And we'll talk about what some ideas about how to find good teachers and how to know good teachers uh, just based on my own experience and see them, know them when you see them. But it's important not to venerate them unless you're consciously symbolizing them with veneration because you know why you're doing it and you know how you're doing it and, and uh, become very conscious about the symbolic ways that you put people on pedestals and what you're really trying to do when you do it because they're just humans, right, at the end of the day. And... They uh, are so often venerated by people who then create illusions about them that simply are not true, cannot be true, and then they try to emulate or be like a teacher who has characteristics that aren't even there. They, don't, they are not real. And so you cannot emulate them because you've created a fantasy illusion in your mind, and that's to be avoided at all costs. And so think very, very highly and heavily before that you spend any time venerating people who are really just human at the end of the day and know that the stories of their lives are far more complex than you'll ever be able to understand. And, you know, the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan once said that there are too many words for anyone to ever tell the true story of their life. And this is exactly what ends up happening is that we often tell stories about other people's lives in short little sentences and fantasy symbolic ideas in our minds and that is destructive to our own progress because the truth is is that there are too many words to explain what those other people went through in order to get wherever they got and there's often things that just couldn't be explained in words because of serendipity and luck and chance and fate and all kinds of things so be very very cautious of that and we all do it 
and you can do it tactically and strategically in ways that actually serve you by finding teachers that you can you can help uh, for example but free from veneration find out you know not only how you can help them but what's going to help them the most and really focus on that that's a very powerful thing to to do and uh and help them in whatever way you can do the teaching that they're doing, but in a non-exaggerated way, and definitely symbolize them. I mean, Nietzsche said we will always need mythologies, and we are mythology-creating creatures, but we can pick better mythologies to create by simply just being consciously aware of how we do it, and then get more deeply involved in creating better ones that serve more people. So that's really, really important. But I see it all the time. People come and they say things about memory competitors, for example, that not only are not true, but those people wouldn't even want you to think are true because it's so debilitating to the people who believe that, right? And that's about figures living and dead. And the reality is, is that the truth is so much better than the fiction. And so you just want to focus on, on the real because that's the thing that gets you where you're going to go. But if you create these elaborate pictures they're like setting fire to the bridge as you're crossing it so many times. And you, you want to really, really make sure that you have that torch of light to guide you that is real and true and in command and in control so that it doesn't burn your bridge while you're crossing it because that's a terrible position to be in. And we've all sort of been there. We've all sort of venerated someone to the status of a god and found out that they just had clay feet. They were just like one of you just like one of us, right? And you either have this moment of oh, self-realization and man, they still did really good anyway, even though they're only human. Or you feel so disappointed because it was all just an illusion. But where did that illusion take place? It took place right there in your chemical bath, in your head. And so you got to watch out for that. It's very poisonous to your attention span because what it ends up doing is you can end up suffering for years and years and years because you essentially were so stupid as to believe in a false mythology that you created. So, <laughs> you know, you can just avoid a lot of suffering. And I'm not uh, speaking from anything but experience because it's happened to me too. Um, and you, you can buy a lot of time back in suffering back from your life because, as they say, expectation is the quickest path to suffering. And if you can just es escape all of the ways in which that <laughs> the path of suffering through expectation can be traveled, you'll, you'll have a much better life. Uh, I'm quite confident of that. So Mr. Space asks, what kind of poetry would you recommend for English learners? Wow, that's a, that's a good question. Um, what kind of poetry do you like? Like there's rhymed poetry, unrhymed poetry, sonnets. Uh, if you're learning English, I don't know, I've never, well, I mean, I'm always learning English, but I've never learned English from the perspective of a second a native speak uh, or a non-native speaker, uh, Dr. Seuss, I guess. Uh, he's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> he's a an interesting cat who writes about cats, socks and fox and socks and all that jazz. I like Dr. Seuss. That's poetry. Uh, depends on your level of sophistication. Um, there's a cool book called Yanoia by Christian Book that's very unusual in that the poetry there. Um, each chapter is a chapter devoted to words that have only one vowel. So like the I chapter is I sit, I inhibit with philosophic wit, like that kind of thing. And uh, each word only has the vowel I, and that's true of every word in the I chapter. And it's also true of every word in the A chapter where the, the only vowel is the letter A. In the E chapter, the only vowel is the letter E, and so on. So that is a book I would recommend. It may, but it may be too sophisticated or it may be too simple. I don't know. It depends on your level. Um, but you could memorize stuff from that because it's really witty and fun and just genius. Um, great, great book. Poetry, too, that I really like. Um, well, again, it's a, a level, a matter of sophistication, but I there's certain parts of the cantos by Ezra Pound that are just gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Um, there's lines from some of the epic poems that are great uh so you know like of achilles uh, of 
of Achilles' son. Uh, no, no, no. Of Peleus' son, Achilles, sing, O muse, the vengeance deep and deadly, whence to Greece, unnumbered ills arose. Like, that's beautiful. Shakespeare has beautiful stuff. All kinds of wonderful things to memorize. So Shakespeare would be a good one. Um, and so if you wanted to really stretch your attention span, you could memorize, for example, dialogues from Shakespeare so that you're memorizing more than one character. That, that could be something for you. Um, Mr. Space says, I've drawn up to six locations with ten stations. Finding locations is a bit difficult for me. Maybe I should go to new places. Definitely. Don't let, uh, don't let memory palace scarcity hold you back. We talked about one meaning of memory palace scarcity before. There's a second, which is the, uh, the non-collection, <laughs> the not getting more memory palaces. It's really important to just continually add more memory palaces. Don't delay, don't stall. There's uh, more memory palaces being built every single day. Go to libraries, go to churches, go to cafes, go to museums, go to make new friends and get yourself invited over for dinner and constantly revisit your own life. There's many, many there. And we have the free course that will give you some worksheets to help you make sure that you can continually build more at magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash YT. Um, Physico says... Dr. Metivier, I know so many angry people. To just stay away from them is to be isolated from society and good people. How can I block this anger and bring joy? This is affecting my attention. Also, some help with sensitive ears to any noise in the room while reading. Okay, well, I don't have them nearby, but for noisy reading, I often have uh, custom-fit earplugs. So go and get custom-fit ones. They're very comfortable. They don't fall out when you lay on your side, etc. Uh... And if you can't afford custom ones, go and just get normal ones and uh, put them in your ear. And that will help a great deal. Uh, it's well worth it. Earplugs are amazing. Uh, don't delay on getting earplugs and do consider getting custom ones. In terms of being isolated from society because you know so many angry people, I know what that's like. I've been there. Uh, I've I used to play in heavy metal bands and, that, you know, not that they were negative or angry people, but I became more sensitive to it as I worked more on meditation and also worked more on just a lot of things that you need to do in order to do the kinds of work that I do. And uh, I just had to distance myself from it. So it doesn't, it doesn't really matter that they were angry people or anything like this, but just all that music has so much anger in it, even though a lot of the people are really sweet and sensitive people. And I still love heavy metal and I still listen to it, but I listen very cautiously to not getting involved in, in the messages and, uh, and focusing more on the music. But I am aware that even without knowing some of those people individually, it has an effect. It's like watching the negative news, and a lot of heavy metal is a response to negative things on the news. So you got to be very cautious about that. So it doesn't necessarily have to be about the people. It can also be about the, the kinds of consumption habits of the people that are around you. Also, my film scholar days are pretty much over, but I still love, uh, love film, and I still love particular kinds of film, but I'm very cautious about what kinds of things are in those films. So we just saw Venom the other day. And uh, as someone who has an interest in critical thought and cultural criticism and the trends and the, and the unconscious mind of society and so forth, like it's well worth having gone and seen. But it, it is primarily a kind of negative story and so forth. So be cautious of that. But in terms of people and replacing them, look, you don't have to live your life with those people under the circumstances that they choose to be negative in. So you can just meet those people individually at cafes or bowling or in parks or in, in ways that slant things towards being positive already, right? And if they can't handle that situation and be positive in it, well then all the more reason not to, not to just, just not be around them. And go and just find other people. I don't know where you are in the world or what situation it would be that it, it, there would be a barrier of finding more positive people. But if you can't find them, create the situation in which they will come. So you're here on a chat, and that suggests to me that you could probably go to meetup.com. You could probably find a bunch of people with shared interests, and you could probably find groups that are about meditation or 
something along walking and enjoying nature or maybe there's a memory improvement group around. I don't know. But you can just create the kind of people you want to be around by using something like Meetup and, uh, you know, just make it happen. Create the reality you want to live. And don't don't uh, just assume you have to be isolated from society. I'm pretty convinced that there's got to be a way. And even if you had to be isolated from society temporarily, I'm not so sure that that would necessarily be a bad thing. I went through a couple of years of pretty extreme isolation. I dropped out of high school, for example, and uh, just basically did my own research project because I couldn't stand what they were doing at school. I needed to do my own thing, and I hardly saw anybody except for my mum during that time, and the odd time I was able to hitchhike, or when I finally got a car, I drove to another town where my friends were because they were a good three and a half hours away, two and a half hours away, and uh, I didn't see them a whole lot. And then when I did see them, because I was doing so much learning and reading, they were all, you know, they were still my friends, but we didn't connect in quite the same ways. And the ways that we needed to connect were often around these topics that I wasn't even that much more interested in. And when I did think about them, I had to think about them from uh, maybe not a higher level, but from a different realm, which is more intellectual and so forth. So then I, you know, I started to do things like in zine culture and I made my own magazines uh, or zines, better said, started to send them around. Next thing you know, I'm going to zine conventions and meeting people who also made zines. And yeah, there were some negative characters there as well, but met all kinds of cool people. And uh, those later became memory palaces, those convention rooms, and have some great interesting memories from the people that I met who also made zines. So there's a way to find these people for sure. Um, and ultimately, just as we're saying here that you shouldn't venerate humans uh, positively, you shouldn't over-exaggerate the negativity in others either because they all have their lives and their stories. And there's a reason that they are the way that they are. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I feel that I've been in similar situations. I don't know that they're exactly the same as yours, but there's got to be a solution. And the number one thing that I would do if I were you is if the group doesn't exist, create it. Create it. There's so many tools on the internet. You could be on YouTube making videos that have the name of your city and what it is you would like to do with people and just start to invite them. And you can there say, you know, this is for positive people who are interested in real and substantial discussion about X. So leave your leave your negativity at the door if you have it. I don't know. Like, I mean, you, because it's your group, you create the rules of the game. So that can be very powerful. Um, Rahel says, it takes me so long creating visual imagery. Any suggestion that can help? Yes, create more visual imagery. Go into wherever you're struggling and time yourself. Give yourself a little timed task. So if you're going to encode 10 pieces of information, put on the timer and spend no more than one minute per image. Get where you get and work under constraint and see how you can improve because chances are you can improve significantly but stop focusing on how long that it takes you to create the images and start focusing on what you can do in shorter and shorter periods of time to get what result and then really focus on what what is it that's happening in uh, in those results and and then think about how you can improve and just make it constant, progressive, meaningful, substantial, analytically driven, data-based improvement over time. And don't focus on how long it's taking. Ne never concentrate on that. Always focus on what your goals are and how you're going to reach them and the data that you create and where you can refine your practice. That's the uh, solution that I have for you there. And speaking of refining practice, if you haven't registered yet, come and get registered to the webinar on meditation and memory techniques at magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash VM. Look forward to seeing you there. And uh, I'll type that in there for you so you can just click it in the chat if you haven't gone and registered already. That would be awesome. Okay, so um, Sevench. Uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, but... Hi, Anthony. I'm from Turkey. Will I be able to watch later? I've been watching since 6.30. Now I have to go to work. Well, have a great day at work. Thanks for being with us, that's for sure. You say thank you for this. I feel I'm gaining my concentration back. 
Um, excellent, excellent. Yeah, this will be here. You can just uh, come back to the channel. If you ever have a problem finding the channel, just go to magneticmarymethod.com forward slash YouTube and it will direct you to our channel here. And uh, yeah, I also recommend the previous replay on how to study fast. It's, uh, it's related to this one. And uh, by the way, if you're just joining us and you haven't said hello yet in the chat, please let me know who you are, where you are, what you're doing, what you're thinking, and hit the thumbs up. Get subscribed to this channel if you aren't subscribed already. And uh, do consider joining us for this webinar at magneticmarymethod.com forward slash VM. We're going to talk about how to use meditation with memory techniques and how to use memory techniques with meditation in a perfect circle because you can really improve your memory practice by improving meditation and use the memory techniques to improve your meditation. Ryan is here, says hello. Hello, Ryan. Thanks for saying hello. Good to meet with you today. Appreciate you taking a moment to join us in the chat. All right, so let's carry on and talk about endurance. So attention span will improve your endurance, but you've got to sort of learn some of the things that are going to come up along the way and accept them. So frustration, for example. And that's why I wanted to mention this uh, Sans Forgetica font earlier, is that it's like talking about the virtue and the benefit of obstruction. And a lot of people just don't see obstruction that way, but that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. It's, it's a benefit and virtue if you understand the challenge frustration curve. So what this means is, is that if you're not being challenged, you're not growing. But most of us, we put the cart ahead of the horse and we get frustrated really, really quickly and then we give up. And if you do that, don't punish yourself for it. It's normal to give up if you're frustrated. I mean, who wants to be frustrated? It's painful. The brain, the insular cortex actually creates pain responses. But you're the only person who has any control over this. So if you ever want to get anywhere, you need to understand this, is that you're not going to grow if you're not challenged. you got to stretch. Every musician under the sun that is worth their weight in music, so to speak, if music weighs anything, they are constantly drilling themselves and pushing their challenge. That's how you grow in music, and it never ends. It never ends. But if you take on drills that frustrate you, you're going to stop. And uh, my base is over here. I do this all the time. Just add on layers of difficulty and um, like some of the crazy things that you do in bass. Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> but I am very, very aware of, oh, this is frustrating me. So I scale it back. And part of what is called dedicated practice is, ha is, is having a strategic means of focusing in on the niggly little areas and, and knowing when to do it so that you don't get frustrated and you continue to stay in challenge until that you get to mastery, but then not letting mastery devolve into um, uh, de-skilling, right? Because never be too sure. You always want to skill yourself and keep yourself getting skilled by practice and challenge. Because uh, if you don't practice, you will de-skill yourself. So be accept that frustration is normal, but always create situations in which that you're able to scale back to being challenged so that you don't give up. And then you've got to experiment and you've got to track your results. This is very simple by just having a memory journal, right? And the same thing with exploring and mapping the territory. Create journals. You're, you're like an artist of your own mind and you're a scientist of your own mind. You've got to track and you've got to be able to see your progress over time. And the only way to do that, don't try to juggle it in your memory. Use your memory to memorize information that improves your life, helps you pass exams, helps you speak languages. Don't, I, I don't see any point in memorizing data unless you're a real you know, sports and performance uh, geek, which is fine uh, in that case. Um, but really, really focus on the information that matters and let paper uh, take care of the rest or whatever tracking device that you do. But make sure that you're doing this. This will help you create endurance, which creates more attention span because you're able to see your progress. And you are able to see the frustration and keep yourself being in, chal in, in challenge. So that's really important. So Daqua says, thank you. Well, thank you, Daqua. I really appreciate having you here today. And uh, Mr. Space says, in visual imagery, what is the effective way to recall the image in the mind? Is it important to think about image details? These are all great questions, Mr. Space. And I highly recommend that you get into some deeper training for um, 
creating imagery correctly in the first place. So if you are not able to recall the imagery in your mind, it's probably because you're not creating it profoundly enough. And so that just comes through practice, and it's what we've talked about today. And I shared, you know, that, uh, uh, like, the Sanskrit from yesterday, was it prapanchami? I think that's what it was. Tat prapanchami? Um, uh, you know, but it, I wasn't so sure, and there's something wrong with the imagery there. So i got to look at the imagery and make sure. Actually, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Tat prapanchami. Um, but... It comes down to really, really knowing that you have all of the magnetic modes firing all at the same time. And if you if you cut corners and so forth, it usually backfires, and then you're not so sure. Uh, and that that's not a, that's not a good position to to be in. Um, and with that particular Sanskrit, I haven't gone and listened to the chant to to check my pronunciation, which is part of the problem. So I'm just, kind of memorizing a pronunciation that I made up, but that I didn't feed myself properly with the sound. Now, I was partly doing an experiment to see how that the difference would be. I split test, because normally that's what I do. Uh, and I feel that, uh, that it's better for upfront immediate results to always listen to it being chanted so that I actually am creating the imagery in accordance with how it is pronounced. But it is a, uh, this is something I'm always influenced by since it happened, which is not that long ago, but Tenzel Ali said, you know, I don't always use the memory techniques uh, because I sometimes want to see what are the other things I would do in order to get the same stuff learned. And uh, in this case, I still use the memory techniques, but just as a variation, just a split test. It's an experiment. And it's definitely better so far to, to listen to the actual chant rather than try to memorize what I think it should be pronounced as. Because uh, then that saves time in having to go back and correct it, but it also makes sure that the imagery is stronger in the first place because the magnetic mode of sound is already activated at a much higher level. Um, Physico says, I'm so honored to be here. It's an intellectual relief from a stress culture. Hope to talk to you in person and sincerely thank you. Well, thank you, Physico. Always great to have you here. And uh, yeah, it's a stressful culture out there. I mean, so many of us, we get lost in YouTube vortexes and you know you put in one uh <laughs> one thing you want to search for and the next thing you know it's all you see is that particular thing and you didn't really want to get lost in that loop um but you do and so you got to be careful and have discernment in what you search for in the first place so yeah garbage in garbage out in many many cases not always but uh, you can learn to to scrub that garbage out of your mind as well. But I really appreciate all your interaction, Physico. It's been fantastic. And uh, managing self-talk is certainly a, a huge one. So one of the things that uh, you want to do when you're, when you're practicing your attention span is think about all the things that, that really get in the way of you paying attention. And a lot of it is negative thoughts about the self. I, 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 me, me, me stuff. Oh, I'm stupid. Oh, I'll never do this. I'll never get this. I'll never understand this. Blah, 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 blah. And it's not good, right? It's terrible repetition. And it's blunt force rote learning of a negative thing that is not true about you. Uh, it can't possibly be true because even to have learned the language that you are expressing these negative thoughts in is already an, an extraordinary accomplishment. And so it can't be that way. So you got to embrace more useful repetition. And so um, there's better things to memorize uh, about yourself oh, and repeat again and again and again. So I often, you know, the little train that could, somehow that just gelled with me when I was a kid. And I often think of that. And it's a much, much better thing to think about the little, the thought like, I can do this, I can do this. And then you surround yourself with all kinds of people and information and you're constantly feeding yourself with the reassertion of what it is you want to do. That's useful repetition and embrace it. And then when you use memory techniques, yes, you've got to repeat some of that stuff in order to get it into long-term memory, but that's useful information when you follow the recommendation that we always talk about in the magnetic memory method world, which is memorize only the information that improves your life. Not shopping lists, not random la-di-da stuff that 
that has no value that's not going to get you a raise or get you speaking a language or or is just for a little clap oh yay who cares i mean doing memory stunts is going to give you a little um a little ego boost for you know however long it lasts but being able to speak a language is is going to give you stuff that lasts for life it's going to give you brain health that lasts for life so focus on that even though it's tougher perhaps up front you make it a lot easier by using memory techniques going directly to the core information taking that challenge and uh, then then goofing around with what a lot of the memory training books teach which is random lists of useless words and shopping lists and all this sort of stuff so um, if it's going to be shopping lists shopping lists in a foreign language that makes sense <laughs> um, but avoid blunt force learning no matter what and think of your mind as a theater where all of these images that you're going to use, magnetic imagery, you, you're, going to, you're going to be the theater director and you put that out on the stage and you, act it, you ask it to enact whatever it did the last time and it's never going to do it the same way as the last time. All it needs to do is deliver the lines effectively, even if there's variation. And so that's why repetition is, can be so powerful and that's why f f force feeding yourself tons and tons of rote learning through index cards is so an antithetical to creativity. It's not a creative act at all, unless you're integrating magnetic imagery at some level, which is really, really important to do. So you can't use your mind as a theater if you're just in there with a hammer. You're going to have holes in the stage, and you're going to get frustrated, and you're going to get bored, and all the actors are going to flee. But if you're using the memory techniques, and you have these wonderful memory palaces going on, those the images that you create, as the theater director, they're going to come and they're going to get stronger because you're, you're going to use recall rehearsal to help them get stronger. And you're going to get better as the theater director as you go through time and you're going to be able to deliver. So this is really, really powerful and important to understand. And, uh, you know, metaphors, we all use metaphors. We talked a lot about it today, but um, you got to watch the metaphors that you use or you got to watch the ways that you describe yourself and the ways that you describe others. This is can be a path to misery and so pick better metaphors so we kind of already covered that today so leave that for now but uh, don't get involved in the noise so much uh, and we talked about that quite a bit already but I think the one point that we really need to understand is the value of letting go of the outcome and so when you're when you're working on extending your attention span your attention is sometimes just not going to be there and sometimes it's going to be there but either way be a bit indifferent to it and just be scientific about it and just allow things to emerge as they emerge and not get so wrapped up in it, not so involved in it. So when you understand the challenge frustration curve, that's a lot easier because you're like, ah, that's frustration. Back to challenge. Or, oh, I'm not being challenged, so I better challenge myself but not frustrate myself. And so you just let go of the outcome because you've essentially determined the rules of the game in a much more integral way. This is very powerful to do. And uh, you can let go of the outcome in all kinds of ways in life. And it's very good to do because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't, I don't know what's going to happen an hour from now, if I'm honest about it, and neither do you. And so we just go with it, roll with it. And it's a great way of really eliminating negativity from your mind and really scrubbing it out. And working on that, I think you really can permanently get rid of, uh, of fear and worry and concern. Uh, but you got to seek what is true in it as well and not BS yourself, not mystify yourself. And I'm always worried about that, that I'm going to start becoming a bit woo-woo in my head because of all this meditation practice, um, which, uh, by the way, I hope you uh, join us with the, uh, the webinar at magneticmarymethod.com forward slash VM. It would be great to see you there to talk about meditation and memory techniques and see who's interested in that. Now... Being scientific in all of this is really, really important. So I wanted to mention a great line from this book, Skeptic, by Michael Shermer, because it's very important to have skepticism on your side. It's a powerful tool. And a lot of people, they worry that there's too much theory in, uh, in a lot of things. And I often think of this book because it really sets the whole theory thing to rest in, in my mind. And so... Um, there was a quote um, that apparently um, Stephen Jay Gould, I guess it was, uh, he quoted from, from Darwin a lot, and uh, 
He says, how odd it is that anyone should not see that all observation must be for or against some view if it is to be of any service, right? And one of the things that, that people often do is they get all involved in, uh, in theory and they're like against theory because it, it is, you know, there's just too much of it and so forth. Um, and some of us do. We do put out a lot of theory. Uh, but this is really, really important. What, what is said here is that, uh, uh, and this is Shermer's comment on what Darwin was doing here. He said, as the founder of evolutionary theory knew, the facts never just speak for themselves. They are always viewed through the lenses of theory. The two observations and views, data and theory, are the conjoined twins of science. And the interplay of data and theory, he goes on to say, is really what we need. We need to bring data and theory together constantly. We need to understand this. So it's basically what I've been saying by being experimental, exploring, and really understanding that you withdraw, you, you draw theory out of your practice, and then that theory informs your practice. And you've really, really got to understand that that's the that's the way to always be in your sweet spot it's the way to be the scientist in your own mind and uh, i also suggest you understand frames and hierarchies what i mean by this is that the unconscious mind really responds to restraint it responds to constraint it responds to all kinds of rules that are both in nature or that can be constructed from nature so you might not think that your conscious mind wants to be bound by rules, but your unconscious mind probably does. And one of the th things that's so profound and powerful to do for yourself is to, as Tony Buzan said, let the, the rules will set you free. So you've got to find out what rules you're going to use to create frames around you. And then there are social hierarchies, and where do you fit in these? And you know where do you want to fit in them? And what are the legitimate and ethical ways to navigate your way through these social hierarchies? And this, is, this links back to what I was saying about not venerating other humans, but knowing when you do and what that symbolism means and being more actively engaged in the symbolism. That's really important because it's a way of navigating those, those hierarchies and using frames uh, around yourself. So... Essentially, planning the next day is a kind of frame, and sticking to that frame is another frame. Or when you go to a classroom and, you know, uh, there are certain rules of engagement there, if you honor and respect those, even if you don't agree with them, then that's a way of, you know, really honoring your unconscious mind that, that does actually uh, appreciate frames. And I was speaking earlier about Dr. Ling's and the three anxieties of predator anxiety and prey anxiety and existential anxiety. And one of the things that people do is they just don't respect the frames of social meetings or of classrooms and so forth. And they wind up punishing themselves later. That really interrupts their attention span because they feel guilt, right? And consciously, they're, you know, they're maybe not wrong about the stupidity of certain social rules and, you know, you, you get annoyed and so forth at, at this or that thing in society and so forth. But if you really, really think about it, you end up punishing yourself later because you wish you would have just obeyed or whatever and <laughs> followed those rules in the first place. And so you can relieve yourself uh, of a lot of concentration and focus that goes to that nonsense by thinking more about the role of frames in society and where you fit in them and then just simply following along symbolically even if you don't agree and you'll, you'll see that your unconscious mind may be um, a little bit kinder to you in terms of letting you have a better attention span because you're more guilt-free simply by following along. Now that doesn't mean you're not critical of things that you don't you know, become a reformer if you want to reform certain things in the world, but understand that there you're definitely going to have to understand frames and hierarchies in order to even have a chance of changing anything because you can't change what you don't understand. So this is a little bit theoretical, but also this is what informs our practice and we draw theory from practice and these are things that, that I've certainly used in order to, to do the things that I enjoy doing and uh, hope it helps you as well. Um, now, in terms of finding good teachers, I always try to find people who are fearless seekers of the truth and that they're scientific learners. And, you know, 
you never have to go in fear if you are obeying the the realities of what science is. It's a tool. That's all it is. It's a tool that helps you gather evidence that lets you either verify or dismiss the veracity of claims. And it's very, very powerful. Just leave it at that. Understand that, yes, humans abuse the privilege. Uh, Jaron Lanier in Dawn of New Everything talks very intelligently. There's a great uh, quote there <laughs> where he's just like, we often have the science we don't deserve. And so, but that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with science. It's just that there's something wrong with a lot of scientists. But seek people who know that about science and are very honest and ethical about it and that are human about the, the weaknesses. And those teachers will help you have a better attention span because they're paying attention to themselves and they're honest and ethical about themselves. And they may not be that way every single day, but when you don't venerate your teachers uh, in ways that are useless and unhelpful, then you'll be much better served by that. And you'll be create you'll be paying a kind of attention that serves everybody including them um now the next thought for you is kind of interesting i was listening to eric weinstein this morning and he was talking about healthy competition uh and an idea from peter Thiel that competition is for losers and one of the things that he was saying is that you should think very deeply about finding your arch nemesis in the in the world and it should be an arch a, a person who is ideally around your same age and is someone that that uh, you actually can be recognized by and that you actually are in legitimate competition with. And so there's a video that, that he has all about that and I'll link back to it uh, when I set up the, the, the replay for this. But it's a really great video and uh, it's interesting to me because I certainly have this in my own uh, of my own life and, and more than one arch nemesis and incidentally it's not it's not the, the nemesis the nemesis is not someone that like the word nemesis literally means that you couldn't possibly destroy that person um but it's not about destroying them it's about having them as being like the mark the, the mark that you have to beat right or, or that you're somehow uh moving towards so you can set goals and always keep in mind the the territory that has been mapped that is different than yours, um, but that has some guideposts and some real beacons that you can follow and also avoid, right? And so it's interesting. I won't get into the, the people that come to my mind for this, but really, really interesting and powerful. So watch that video from him and uh, and really think about how that works with your goals and your milestones and that paradox of letting go of the outcome anyway, even though you have goals and outcomes and speaking of goals, I think the real trick with goals and the sweet spot of making them work for yourself, it's not about smart goals or smarter goals and all that jazz that everybody talks about. Yes, you want to have smart goals uh, for sure. They want to be, you know, measurable and achievable and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, what does it matter if they're measurable and achievable if they're not true, right? So test the truth of your aspiration, whatever it may be. One of the ways that I did it is journaling every day. And I quickly found out that that was not really a goal that I really wanted because it was not true and I couldn't write about it every day. And so I just changed it until I could write about it every day and then I wrote about it for years and it actually within a couple of weeks came true because it was true. The veracity of it was so clear and I was like, oh, well, if that's what I really want, boom, it's done. So you got to test that because otherwise you get yourself into golden handcuffs and I got really close to getting myself into golden handcuffs and I'm really glad that I did this writing every day because it increased my attention span towards what I really, really wanted and I focused on it and I got it relatively quickly. And one of the reasons why it worked so well is because it was focused on something much bigger than myself. So my golden handcuffs would have been focused on really what one other person wanted and what I thought I wanted with that person, whereas what I really want is for the entire world. And I think that ultimately, if you really think about it, probably what you want is ultimately for the whole world as well. And if not, then ask yourself, why isn't it? And that can be a very good mental journey for you. And uh, if you use all the tools we talked about earlier today, then I think you'll find that, uh, that you, have, uh, <laughs> you have some wonderful ways of ex expanding your attention span just by asking yourself, why aren't you trying to improve the entire world or at least working on something bigger than yourself? Um, and then think about the warm glow. Of, of just being someone who is contributing to the world and, and spreading 
interesting information outwards that boosts your self-esteem. We know this in the science. We know that you actually will feel a sensation if you're, you're giving. And if you're giving uh, for different purposes and outcomes, you'll have different uh, experiences of this glow. Um, but be wary of traps. So Peter Singer, in The Most Good You Can Do, he talks about how some of these uh, acts of giving are actually causing more trouble than they're worth. So you want to definitely be aware of that. But find alignment with what matters to you and then just simply be all in about it. That's really important. Now, on to meditation. Just a few notes. There's multiple forms of meditation. I don't know that every single one will improve your memory, but the standard stuff, there's good data that it will, but you got to memorize, uh, you got to meditate at least four times a week. So be all in for at least that much. I think that these, these teachings that med- you should meditate for 45 minutes a day and so forth, this is wildly, wildly exaggerated. Um, I, I would say that generally I probably do meditate that much every single day, but not in one sitting. Um, uh, although it, it gets there sometimes, but the reality is, is I don't think it's it's necessary, and I don't think there's good evidence in the science around that. I think maybe 15 minutes max, 10 minutes is fine. The, the new Sam Harris app, I broke my app fast and got it because I've been a supporter there, and I wanted to see. And he's got his, you know, really focused on 10 minute sessions, which is just great. And so I recommend that. Um, and for me, like I've used all kinds of forms, but one of the things that has been the best is vo- verbal forms of meditation. So Kirtan Kriya, and then memorizing and chanting, so to speak, reciting the Ripu Gita has been really great. Um, and long passages. So you could start with short things to memorize, like Satanama or Ami Tofo, um, and linking those with your fingers. Or you could go for longer stuff, depending on where your skills are um, with that. And... Uh, You can uh, choose the Ripu Gita if you want. Uh, I think it's great. There's lots of cool stuff in Sanskrit to to work with. Um, And join me on this webinar at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash VM. And I hope to see you there. Give you that link one more time in the chat. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. If you have any questions whatsoever that you didn't ask today, then by all means, come back to this video, pop them in the in the discussion, or some other video, ideally one that's related to the, the topic for the sake of organized data, structured data, as the, the powers that be call it. Um, really interesting to always follow up with people and appreciate the opportunity to do so. Hope this helped you out today, and I hope that we'll see you on this upcoming webinar at the end of the month. And uh, Ravi says, amazed. Thank you for that, Ravi. I am also amazed. I'm amazed by this technology, what it's doing for us, what it can do. And uh, it's, uh, you know, we don't know how long it's going to last. So take advantage of it while you can. I thank you for being here, Ravi, and for saying hello. It's uh, just an amazing and miraculous thing that we have at this moment. And we just don't know how long it's going to last. But... We do know that we can focus on the present moment and enjoy it and and uh, really use it to the highest possible purpose. So I hope that this has served you today in whatever way that, uh, that it did. And if you have questions, do feel free to get in touch through the various means of doing it the best means always is through magneticmemorymethod.com. There's a, a podcast just about every week and a new blog post just about every week without fail there for you. And if you uh, go and check the back record, I think you'll find something there for everybody. Maricella says, thank you. Thank you, Maricella. Glad you were here today. Um, always appreciate seeing you. And what can I say? That has been an epic session (laughs) today, and there will be epic sessions yet to come, to be sure. So, until we have a chance to speak again, this is Anthony Metivier signing off from the Magnetic Memory Method headquarters in Brisbane. Come visit me at magneticmemorymethod.com. If you haven't hit that thumbs up yet, please do so now. Leave a comment in the replay if you're watching the replay. 
Mr. Space says, thank you. You helped me a lot. Well, thank you, Mr. Space. Great questions. And uh, listen, everybody, have a great start to your week wherever you are in the world. And just be kind to other humans and understand that they are all yourself because they are represented in yourself. In that chemical bath in your head is the only place that those people are. I mean, they are out in the world, in their own world. They exist. But at the end of the day, they're in you. And so treat them as you would yourself because they are represented in yourself, in your chemical bath. And if you have suffering and it's getting in the way of your attention span, you can deal with that. You're the only one who can, and that's by treating others kind and well. So thank you, everybody. Lisa, Lisa says thank you. Thank you, Lisa, Lisa. Really great. I love the double Lisa name. And until we have a chance to speak again, again, come visit me at magneticmerrymethod.com. Join the webinar at forward slash VM if that appeals to you. And until we have a chance to speak again, keep yourself magnetic. Bye-bye.